Earth Science Applications Week. Uh, we're really excited to share the presentations with you today. Uh, my name is Tyler Pantel. I'm a fellow and center lead with Na uh, the NASA Developed National Program uh, based out of our Boston, Massachusetts location um, out of Boston University. Um, yeah, really excited uh, to share these uh, presentations and projects today. Um, a few uh, just housekeeping notes as we get started. If everyone could please stay muted and keep their cameras off um, just uh, so that we are running smoothly and preserving bandwidth, that would be much appreciated. If you do have questions along the way uh, for our presenters, uh, feel free to drop them in the chat and they will be answered over there. Um, we do have quite a few folks on the call today, and there are going to be a lot of presenters shuffling in and out. So we appreciate your patience in advance if we do run into any technical difficulties. Um, that being said, um, I am excited to hand off uh, now to our director of NASA's Applied Sciences Program, um, Lawrence Friedel, for some welcoming words and remarks. Great, thank you so much, Tyler. Appreciate it, uh, and welcome everyone to, to day three. So, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to people where wherever you may be joining from. Um, this year, we've had over sixteen hundred people register for Earth Science Applications Week, uh, a record number, um, and really, it's people have been tuning in from from all over, uh, and so we're extremely pleased that we can be sharing the information uh, that we have, the work with our partners really pleased that we can be showcasing the, the benefits that, that, that we're enabling um, and the benefits to society that, uh, that are coming from this and the chance to share these ideas globally. Um, and so while we've had a lot of examples um, that are sometimes based in the United States, um, we do have a lot of projects and a lot of partners that we're working with uh, across the planet. And I think today is gonna be a fantastic uh, example um, of those of those types of efforts. Um, truly, science um, is a global effort, uh, and there is this global community. Uh, and, and you know, Earth science satellites, you know, by the very nature of orbital mechanics, is taking observations from around the world. Uh, and so, the other thing is that NASA has a very open data policy, and so the data and the information products that we're collecting by making it openly available all these different countries, all these different organizations everywhere can be really using this. And so as we are moving into an open source science approach uh, here at the at NASA Science, the development that we're doing in terms of these applications, as we're going to be sharing them, that means that people around the world can be using the data, using the algorithms, using these applications uh, to achieve those benefits uh, as well. And so really this sort of truly supports that global nature of cooperation and that, that science enables. Um, but there's also connections between different types of science. Uh, and so here at NASA, we're also doing planetary science and heliophysics and astrophysics, um, and of course, everything that we're doing uh, in earth science. Uh, and no one knows that better than a senior leader here at NASA, uh, it is Sandra Connolly. Um, she is the Deputy Associate Administrator for Science uh, at NASA Headquarters, and we couldn't be more pleased and more honored for her participation this week. So, Sandra, over to you. Hi there. Thanks, Lawrence. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to join you all today. I want to start by thanking you for joining the third annual Earth Science Application Week. We hope this event continues to grow over the years and touch more and more and more communities. This is my first year in attendance, and I'm heartened by the excellent presentations and the strength of NASA's Earth Science community. Thank you for joining and contributing to our mission. By offering my congratulations to the entire Applied Sciences team, thank you for the projects, those that work behind the scenes, those of you who are facilitating this event, and to our partners. You are all bringing science to everyday life. Science Mission Director, we come to explore new questions and learn more about our universe for the benefit of society. Earth Science Application Week highlights many projects that do just that. And so many more researchers, data scientists, and interns across NASA that advance the course as well. I encourage you to keep exploring the depth of science, and I hope encourages you to continue learning and to stay curious 
and plan it. Note from these presentations, the critical of being engaged with the communities with whom you identify. Make sure is heard as you uplift the voices of others and apply your skills and interest for the betterment of your local community. I would like to take a minute to recognize Dr. Lawrence Friedel for his outstanding leadership and dedication to the applied sciences over years, for many years. Karen, doctors Karen St. Germain and Julie Robinson, who lead our and support, fully support this work. I also want to thank NASA's chief scientist and senior climate advisor. Week and always. The leadership team has created a resilient, responsive, and inclusive program that lives out NASA's core values. Finally, I want to offer a special thanks to you all, to the entire Applied Sciences team. Congratulations to you, all of you, and I hope you found this week productive and inspiring. Continue with the great work you're doing, and thank you. Back to you, Lawrence. Great, and now I think I'm gonna pass it back to, to Tyler. Uh, and so, Tyler, do you want to do the introduction of agriculture? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Lawrence and, uh, and Sandra, for those kind words and remarks. Um, we're looking forward to getting into more about the ag agriculture um, program. And so, from today, you'll hear from uh, agriculture program and NASA Harvest, as well as NASA Develop um, over the next hour, um, as well as Severe. So, to start off, we'll pass it to Sarah Brennan uh, for the introduction to agriculture program. Thank you very much, Tyler. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a true honor to follow Lawrence and Sandra. Thank you for those opening comments. And I'm excited to start today's presentations with agriculture. I'm really impressed with the week so far, not only with the organization and the quality of presentations, but with the wide breadth of work being done and the passion behind it. As Tyler mentioned, my name is Sarah Brennan, and I'm presenting today on behalf of Brad Doran, the program manager, who's the program manager for the agriculture application area. So if you have ever heard Brad talk about the need for global agriculture monitoring, you've likely heard him tell the story about the great grain robbery. In 1972, what was then the Soviet Union was undergoing a severe drought and having, which was a major contributor to multiple crop failures. They needed foreign grain to feed their people. Recognizing their inability to harvest that year, the Soviet Union purchased 15 million tons of wheat, corn, soybeans, and barley from the United States, in addition to million more, million more tons of crops from the international market. By the time the international trade community was aware of the failed crops, the majority of the grain from the international market had been secured by the Soviet Union. The massive purchase, which took the U.S. by surprise, depleted the country's grain stocks and caused prices to soar. This was later dubbed the Great Grain Robbery and was great evidence of why we needed crop intelligence and global agricultural monitoring. Fortunately, Landsat 1 was already planned to launch in 1972, allowing for the first ever view of drought and crop conditions from space. Next slide, please. Landsat 9 was just launched in September of 2021, and we're celebrating this year 50 years of Landsat imagery. Collectively, the mission has gathered more than 10 million scenes of Earth, all of which are now freely available to the public. Landsat passes the same place on Earth 16, every 16 days and provides 30 meter resolution. It views individual farms and fields, providing critical data for management and food resources. For instance, the sensor's ability to see infrared light enables us, enables us to tell when crops are stressed, even sometimes when plants appear healthy to the naked eye. Landsat provides information on crop stress, which affects crop yields, can help us forecast crop production, and can also identify potential risks like drought. Next slide, please. But Landsat is not the only sensor that gives us great perspective on the world's agriculture. Other satellites like GPM and SMAP produce data that is used in tools that ag producers rely on regularly. We know these tools are valuable for making decisions today. When using Earth observations data for our assessing current or future agriculture conditions, remote sensors can detect changes in surface reflectance, temperature, elevation, potential changes, and runoff. 
Satellite data can help us also study changes in precip, stream flow, groundwater, and soil moisture. And crop vegetation can also be monitored as well as plant stress. Next slide, please. In many of the presentations yesterday, we talked about partnerships, developing partnerships with the objectives to understand the role that Earth observations can play in an already developed community. What are the gaps and what are the opportunities and what is the value that EO can bring to a complex system? Well, through our discussions with potential partners, end users, and through our own experience, we understand that Earth observations can play a critical role in providing unprecedented information on global water market, on global market conditions, water management for agriculture, in-season crop conditions, severe weather and pest warnings, and sustainable farming practices. Next slide, please. NASA has a long history of providing data, information, and models to agriculture users over the past few decades. We have a long-standing MOU with USDA to easily facilitate collaboration and the exchange of information, knowledge, and technology. But we recognize that there is opportunity opportunity to do so much more. More engagements, more partnership development, more communication, more product development, information delivery, and more tech transfer, all for the aim of more benefits to society. So enter the agriculture application area. Over the past few years, the Applied Sciences Program and the Earth Science Division have made significant investments to connect with this community. The aim is to demonstrate the value of Earth observations in agriculture and food security, to understand the community's needs, and also distill common larger issues that can be addressed by utilizing EO. We're working collaboratively with long-standing agriculture research entities like Na at NASA, like AgMIP through NASA GIS, and the Land Cover Land Use Program. We're incorporating and building off the exceptional research and capabilities and capacity building led by the NASA centers. So just as we seek to collaborate and build relationships, excuse me. So just as we seek to collaborate and build relationships externally, we first and foremost aim to coordinate activities and collaborate internally. With the within the application area, we have four program elements that will work together to address domestic, international, and global agriculture and food security. In 2018, NASA established NASA Harvest, a consortium run by the University of Maryland with the mission to enable and advance adoption of satellite EO by both public and private organizations to benefit food security, agriculture, and human environmental resiliency. They focus on agricultural land use, ag productivity, and ag sustainability. NASA Harvest was, admittedly, an experiment in program management in using a consortium to lead and represent NASA's agriculture activities. However, this team, led by Inbal Becca Rishrath, Chris Justice, Alyssa Whitcraft, and Mary Mickish, absolutely excelled at the task at hand. Their objective of communicating the value and opportunities for EO in agriculture was truly phenomenal. Using social media, podcasts, publications, written articles, and traditional media, they reached new communities, built relationships with the private sector with, like Swiss Re and John Deere. They supported application development and applied sciences research like field scale nutrient management with the Illinois Corn Growers Association, estimating crop yields through private sector digital ag tech platform provider, and have dedicated their efforts recently to providing critical crop yield forecasts and food security risks as a result of the invasion of Ukraine. I really could go on and on about NASA Harvest, but Mary Mickish is giving a 10 minute presentation immediately following to show how their work brings applications and applied sciences to their agriculture and food security communities. I highlighted this consortium because it's the consortium model and the resulting impact that was evident enough for us to build another consortium. As I mentioned, there are more partnerships to be built, more needs to be met, and more opportunities to increase the uptake of EO for ag. So we're establishing a second consortium within the agriculture application area. This consortium is being competitively selected. It was competed through NASA Roses and will be announced this fall. The geographic scope of the consortium will be US domestic focus, working closely with USDA and other, and other NASA elements, including NASA Harvest. In addition to the two consortium, the agriculture management team contribute to NASA's representation to the administration's request for information on greenhouse gases, and is also working with ESD leadership to develop partnerships on climate smart agriculture with Mercy Corps and the Gates Foundation. This is clearly a rapidly evolving and growing application area. Next slide, please. 
In the following presentations you're going to hear today from NASA Harvest and others on specific application examples of applied sciences research highlighting the impacts of collaborative development. But I would be remiss if I did not highlight the fact that there is a wealth of information products and tools developed by NASA and partners that are accessible to the ag community regardless of your role or information need. For example, if you are in commodity training or supply chain management, you can utilize NASA Harvest Portal Harvest to Market on the disruptions and impacts to trade. If you're a farmer, you can access tools like OpenET, which will give you information on evapotranspiration and irrigation needs at the field scale. And if you're a resource manager or region, at a regional or uh, country scale, you can use information from tools like the US Drought Monitor and the GeoGlam Crop Reports to be informed about the risks to your community and the outlook of your crops. Next slide, please. So we're thrilled that the director of the Earth Science Division, Karen St. Germain, has been leading our engagement with key stakeholders in the US. It was from a conversation she had with a Growers Association member that led NASA to the 2022 Commodity Classic event, the nation's largest agricultural conference that had over 3,000 farmers present and 2,600 companies. Through her leadership, Brad, Lawrence, and Karen aimed to engage producers through direct outreach and communication. As a result, at the end of August, Karen and colleagues are conducting a Space for Ag tour, where they'll be traveling to Kansas and Nebraska to visit land-grant universities, agricultural research institutions, institutes, farmers, extension educators, and crop association members. Many thanks to Kim Locke, Aries Keck, Chris Thorne, Kate Becker, who are organizing the tour, and to Alyssa Whitcraft, Forrest Melton, and Alex Ruan, who will be joining Karen and Brad in Kansas and Nebraska. Next slide, please. So if you heard my presentation yesterday, I have the same call for action. Get involved. First, get connected. There are newsletters, websites, social media accounts, and conferences and events that will bring you into our world. Support, encourage, and bring in new voices to the discussion, especially early career scientists, social scientists, and local and regional community members. Second, access, explore, and utilize all the data, resources, and tools available to you. And finally, Drive the future, the future of science, the future of this community, the future of the program. Submit needs and ideas, lead research, and speak up. We need you. Next slide, please. I'm excited about the upcoming presentations, and thank you for allowing me to be a part of this in really incredible lineup today. And last slide, I just want to say thank you, and I'll hand it back to Tyler. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah, for kicking things off with your presentation um, and for underscoring the importance of the agriculture applications area, since it really does impact each and every one of us. To share more about the uh, about NASA Harvest, as Sarah mentioned, please welcome Mary Mitkish. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Sarah and, and Lawrence and everyone for the excellent introduction. Um, as mentioned, my name is Mary Mitkish. I am the assistant program manager and communications lead for the NASA Harvest Consortium. Um, Sarah gave a great background on NASA Harvest, but I'll just reiterate, we are NASA's global food security and agriculture program. We currently operate as a consortium of roughly 50 national and international partners, um, working to enable the uptake of earth observation data applications in support of food security, agricultural resilience, and market transparency worldwide. Um, I'll be providing an overview of the program today, I'm hoping to sprinkle in some examples as we go along. Next slide, please. Um, so Sarah gave excellent background, so I'm just going to glance over this really quickly. Um, but a little bit of background on NASA Harvest. Uh, many of you probably already know, and Sarah did a great job of emphasizing that NASA has a long-standing history of investing in remote sensing applications for agriculture, um, going way back at least to the 70s and, and 80s with the Lacey and Agristar activities. Um, but we've come a really long way technologically um, and with our computing capabilities since then. Um, but really beyond just those technological advancements, NASA recognized that there's a huge user demand for Earth observation information when it comes to agriculture. Um, and today, Earth observation data plays a major role in agricultural monitoring and food, food security analyses. Um, but at the time, there was a bit of a gap in the Applied Sciences program to fill this need for quantifiable, reliable, repeatable, and ultimately actionable information. Um, so in 17, 2017, excuse me, when the call went out um, for this kind of agile consortium program, um, 
NASA Harvest was born. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we operate at, um, at, as the Global Food Security and Agriculture Program. Uh, we operate out of the University of Maryland, led by PI and Balbecker Rashef. Um, and we are also NASA's major contribution to the Group on Earth Observations Global Agricultural Monitoring Initiative. Many of you will know that as uh, the G20 GeoGlam Initiative. Um, the purpose of GeoGlam and NASA's harvest role in it is to increase market transparency and improve food security by producing and disseminating relevant information on agricultural conditions and outlooks of production. Um, one of our kind of mottos at NASA Harvest is that the whole is really greater than the sum of our parts, right? Meaning the more we can reduce kind of these siloed activities and come together to collectively leverage our resources and work collaboratively in, in the agricultural remote sensing space, the more likely we're able to quickly and effectively put useful information into the hands of agricultural stakeholders. Um, so what exactly do we do? Uh, in a nutshell, <laughs> NASA Harvest works with partners around the world to apply satellite data to today's most pressing agricultural challenges. Uh, we partner with ag industry experts on projects ranging from crop field forecasting to fertilizer application optimization to production analyses to conservation farming method analyses to machine learning modeling and, and so on and so forth. Uh, next slide, please. So how do we accomplish this? What's our approach? Um, well, first and foremost, and, and Lawrence mentioned this right off the top, and I love that he did so, um, our job is to listen to the needs of agricultural stakeholders and then identify where the EO data can be integrated into new or existing systems to fill knowledge gaps. Um, you'll see kind of this like cool graphical representation of our approach on the left-hand side of your screen, but I think this process is kind of best illustrated with an example. Um, so I'll draw your attention to the right-hand side of the screen as I, as I go on here. Um, so we know that environmental variables, for example, obviously have a massive impact on yields. And we would repeatedly hear from, from ag analysts, from people we are already working with across the academic sector, et cetera, that while there was a lot of information out there regarding um, you know, soil moisture level, average NDVI year, year to year, um, evapotransportation, transportation, you know, all of these ag statistics that are everywhere, right? We found that it was it, a common complaint that it's really challenging to pull all of this information together and digest it and draw meaningful conclusions from it. Um, so there was our, our identified need. We knew that the data was there. So we began to address this challenge by developing a publicly available interactive online tool where users can explore environmental variables over time all in one place. Um, so again, drawing your, your attention to that graphic on the bottom right there, um, you will see what ultimately ended up resulting. This is an online, openly available dashboard. It's free. We call it the Agrometeorological Earth Observation Indicators Dashboard, or AGMET for short. Um, and for each AGMET indicator graphic, um, there consists of several EO data plots that quantify critical indicators related to crop health for a specific region for a specific crop over time. These are updated every seven to 12 days to ensure that users are provided with the most up-to-date information. So with this tool, users now have free access to a more simplified way to visualize and monitor crop health throughout the growing season, with the ultimate goal of identifying potential cropping concerns as the growing season progresses and before a food shortage materializes. Um, these graphics have been incorporated into several organizations' agricultural reports, including the GeoGlam crop monitor reports, which are released monthly, um, the AMS Outlook reports, and some others um, to highlight emerging food security concerns. Um, and I'll mention off top too, we, we tend to do a lot of trainings on the tools that we put out and that are made available. So please follow us, keep up with us if you're interested in learning more about some of the things that I'm presenting today. Um, we're, we're constantly trying to provide learning experiences. Next slide, please. Um, now that was just one quick example of kind of how we identify stakeholder need, identify the information gap, and then work with our partners to address the challenge. Um, however, I wanna just quickly highlight kind of our programmatic initiatives, our focus areas before going any further, because obviously we can't address every single need that's, that's brought up. And of course there are limits to what we can do with satellite-based information. We don't like to overpromise anything and we'd like to be able to deliver on, on kind of the challenges that we're trying to address. 
Um, so from kind of a strategic programmatic, pers programmatic perspective, we've narrowed down, down the types of activities that we take on to ensure that we have a kind of holistic approach where activities can be leveraged and feeding into each other. Um, all of our projects contribute to one or more of these initiative areas. Um, and again, just highlighting, highlighting that with a quick high level example that um, maybe may be familiar to many of you. Um, I'll go back to Sarah mentioned our partnership with the Illinois Corn Growers Association. That's an excellent example of working with a grower organization, uh, for example, who are direct touch points to farmers. Um, they know farmer needs, um, they have farmer members, and they'll often be able to provide um, needs assessments, data, um, feedback that's really important for us to be able to improve uh, things like yield prediction models, for example. So they may come to Harvest and say, hey, uh, our farmers really want to optimize their nitrogen fertilizer application to save on costs without sacrificing on yields, right? That may be the problem, something like that. Um, and then we can say, great, um, we know we can use satellite imagery to measure nitrogen application, and we'll support projects that use EO data to analyze application timing, frequency, and amount, and then make this information available to farmers. Um, so this example kind of folds into several initiative areas. We're building strong partnerships, we're improving data systems and integration, and we're building an ev evidence base for sustainable agricultural practices, um, and for this per example in particular. But this is a way that, that a lot of our projects work. We're making sure to address multiple levels and kind of feed back into an overall system. So the win-win at the end of the day is now we have much needed data to improve our models. The farmers and farmer orgs have better tools to assist with on-farm decisions and over fertilization and the environmentally damaging runoff effects can be reduced. Um, next slide, please. So I think I've mentioned several times now that uh, we are above all else end user focused, right? Like users will not adopt new methods, technologies, tools, you name it. They're not gonna do it if there's not a need. And also if there isn't some sort of level of ownership in them, uh, no matter how good we think the product might be. Um, so I've, I've put a few examples on this slide. I'm not gonna have time to go through all of them, um, but these are some examples of work that we've done over the last five years or so with this kind of end user focus in mind. So from left to right, what you're looking at is um, a map of planted area in Ukraine across both occupied and unoccupied areas, um, tillage impacts on yield over time, um, using machine learning methodologies to identify hotspots, uh, most not notably pests in fields, um, mapping cropland change over time in South America, um, and finally on the end there, the percentage of the percent change in fertilizer application in Ukraine since the start of the war. Um, this is just kind of a range of projects that, that we will have going on at any given moment. Um, and I'll focus really quickly in on the Ukraine example on the left hand side, um, just to give you a bit more detail on, on kind of how that project unfolded. And this is kind of the typical way that, that requests will come in and we'll, we'll try to respond. Um, so when Russia invaded Ukraine, there were almost immediate concerns for agricultural production and global food security as Ukraine is a major food commodity producer and exporter. Uh, the Ministry of Agrarian Policy and Food of Ukraine reached out to our team asking if there's any way we could get a sense of agricultural uh, planting and production in the country when ground access became extremely dangerous um, and production became harder to track. So this is a, a great example where remotely sensed information can provide uh, data and, and facts where when we can't get to the ground or, or do the surveys that we might normally do. Um, so we were able to work quickly with the Institute for the Study of War, who gave us access to occupied area statistics, as well as Planet, a very strong public or, um, sector partner for us, who provided some additional high resolution satellite imagery to work with. And then researchers at, at the University of Maryland and various academic institutions, such as the University of Strasbourg and others, developed a, a map of agricultural planting across the entire country um, in both occupied and unoccupied territories. This information could then be provided back to the Minagri of Ukraine to provide insight on potential yield decreases, how much may be able to be exported, um, how much may have to be stored, for example. All of these are extremely, it's all extremely useful information in kind of the ag decision making processes that they will be faced with. Next slide, please. Um, so now just touching quickly on, on some of kind of these other longer standing projects that the consortium has been working on. Um, and I'm gonna shift into like dashboard tool mode. Um, we're always focusing on, on ensuring better data access in as simple and easy to use formats as possible. 
So I've got some examples here of, kind of dashboards, mobile applications that we've collaboratively, collaboratively developed over the years. Um, from left to right, again, you're looking at uh, Harvest Now on the end there, which is an offline mobile data collection application built on top of the ArcGIS Survey123 platform. Um, next is the SEMA Harvest app, which is a farm management mobile application developed primarily for Argentinian farmers with one of our, our very strong private sector partners in, in, the, uh, in Argentina. Um, next is the COVID-19 dashboard for agriculture, which was uh, spun up in response to obviously the COVID-19 pandemic in the, in the early days when there was a lot of question around where cases were and how um, agricultural logistics might be impacted. Um, next up is the Harvest GLAM or Global Agricultural Monitoring Tool, which has several EO data layer, layers built in for agricultural analyses, um, kind of depending on user interests regarding production, um, region, etc. cetera. Um, and then finally on the end there is the Harvest Market Dashboard that Sarah mentioned, um, which is our newest dashboard focused on monitoring the agricultural supply chain, crop conditions, uh, price fluctuations, et cetera. Um, so again, I'll focus in just on one example. I don't want to go over my time. I know probably getting close already anyway, um, but I'll draw your attention to the, the far left example, that Harvest Now mobile data collection app that I mentioned. Um, in this case, we were conducting a field data collection campaign with regional FAO partners in Malawi. Um, the purpose of these types of campaigns really is to acquire ground data to improve our machine lear learning algorithm's ability to accurately identify crops and crop production in smallholder systems, which um, if anyone here has worked with smallholder ag, as I'm sure many of you have, you know that uh, field boundaries and, and identifying crops can often be challenging, even kind of to identify with the human eye, uh, and a lot of training data is needed to improve remote sensing models. Um, so in this case, Esri Survey 123 was a great option for us to collect the ground data, um, but a few key pieces were missing that, that would make it a really excellent option. Um, such as the ability to manually geotrace field boundaries, um, input data offline as there's not really great network connection when you're out in the field, um, et cetera. So working directly with, with Esri Partners, again, a very strong partnership, we were able to develop new features together that saved time implementing our data collection surveys, moved towards real-time data processing and analysis, uh, which previously could take months, um, improved data accuracy, um, and, and accelerated the quantity and quality of ground data that we were able to collect. So again, this is just one example of how um, kind of pooling resources, having these strong partnerships, knowing the, the user needs and, and what we need to get out of um, what we're trying to do is, is really effective when, when we work together collaboratively. Next slide, please. So I haven't been timing myself, but I'm guessing that I'm getting pretty close to time here. So I just wanted to to finish up with some of our, our major consortium goals, which we're always keeping in mind um, when we're scoping out harvest projects. Um, I won't read down the list. I'm, I'm sure you'll get the slides afterwards, but our ultimate goal is really to put earth observation applications into the hands of users who can benefit from them um, in support of, of improving farming methodologies, um, in support of environmental resilience, and, and in support of, of market transparency. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and, and finish up. Uh, next slide, just a, a thank you. And if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. I believe there will also be links to several of the dashboards and tools that I mentioned there for you as well. Great. Thank you so much, Mary, for sharing more about NASA Harvest and how the program engages with end users. Up next, we'll transition into a project highlight of Open Mapflow presented by another member of the Harvest team. Ivan Zvonkov. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Ivan Zvonkov. I'm a machine learning engineer at NASA Harvest, and I'll be talking about Open Map Flow, which is a library for rapid map creation with machine learning and Earth observation data. Next slide, please. So beyond, beyond me, also as part of this project, uh, um, there's a lot of contributions from Dr. Hannah Kerner, Dr. Catherine Nagalembe, and Gabriel Tseng, who are all part of the Harvest program. Next slide. So in the next five minutes, I'll go over these four things. Um, actually, could you go back? Yeah, just so just so everybody kind of has an overview of what the five minutes will contain. 
machine learning plus remote sensing, how that kind of dynamic works. Um, I'll give an overview of open map flow, how we are currently using it um, within the harvest program, and then a long-term vision for this project. All right, next slide. Okay, so this is what uh, machine learn learning workloads look like in remote sensing. Uh, they often start with uh, gathering a remote sensing data set, feeding that data set into a machine learning model and, and thereby training the machine learning model. And then using the machine learning model to create um, some sort of output, like a geospatial map. And so, next slide, please. What we commonly see in the literature, what we common, commonly see in machine learning projects is that um, the work does not go all the way to the end. A lot of the, a lot of the work in remote sensing and machine learning stops once uh, you have a machine learning model and you evaluate it on some sort of test set. Uh, but a lot of people don't actually end up using the model to create um, the final output that's necessary for downstream applications. Next slide, please. And we think that's probably because it requires a lot of time and it requires a lot of effort and cost because in many cases you want to make a map for a large region and that's a lot of predictions with your model. And so you need to come up with some sort of architecture and, and a lot of compute to actually um, to make that work. Next slide. And so this is where Open Map Flow comes in. So Open Map Flow is a library for rapid map creation with machine learning and earth observation data. And it's really meant to make this whole process a lot smoother, starting with a data processing pipeline, going to uh, training a machine learning model, and then creating a map with that machine learning model. Next slide. And specifically, we really kind of focused on reducing the time and cost that um, it takes to to take a machine learning model that you've trained, to take any of the deep learning models that uh, that people are creating in the machine learning community and be able to make actually a, a map that can be used, one in downstream applications, uh, a map that can be used to reveal failure modes with the machine learning models that you may be using, um, and a map that can uh, open up a whole bunch of other um, research areas to explore. Next slide. So now I'm going to kind of go through the, these components um, in a little bit more detail of uh, how they're actually working in Open Map Flow. Um, so first, starting with the data processing pipeline, the input is essentially just a, a CSV file where you have a coordinate or some sort of um, location information associated with a binary class. And then those that data, those are like labels, they can be used to um, fetch uh, satellite data from Google Earth Engine. Um, and then pair the satellite data and the labels are paired together, and thereby we create a machine learning ready data set. And once we have machine learning ready, ready data set, we can move on to the next part of open map flow, which is the machine learning model training. And so here we take the, the data that we just created, we split it into training and evaluation data, um, and we use that to, to train a model and then to evaluate a model. And once we have a trained model, um, we don't just stop there like many projects might. Uh, but we actually move on to the next portion, which is rapid map creation. And so here we deploy our model um, into a provided Google Cloud architecture. And, um, and then we do parallel predictions on, on a large region of interest in a kind of efficient way, um, keeping the cost of both compute and storage low. Next slide. And so this is a, this is a Python package. Um, so if you have a Python environment, you can pip install it basically just running this command. Um, and then you also need a Google Cloud account to be able to deploy the resources, uh, but uh, it's open source. So you can always look at the code um, and understand how things work. And it has a whole bunch of documentation alongside it. Next slide. All right, and how we are using it. Um, so we're using it right now to create um, many different um, cropland maps. So those are maps which indicate where there are crops growing and where there are crops that are not growing or where there are no crops, essentially. Um, and so in the next slide, uh, you'll see how this fits into the greater kind of uh, scope of what Harvest Africa, um, har Harvest generally, but specifically, we're doing a lot of work in Harvest Africa. Um, and so Open Map Flow essentially is the, the glue that connects the satellite imagery to the satellite um, time series data, to the deep learning, to actually generating the insights related to agriculture. And so things that we're able to, to, um, to generate once we have these cropland maps are things like area estimates. We're able to use the maps um, to actually go and do further field work, and we're able to use them for um, 
uh, as an input to predicting yield in uh, regions of interest. Next slide. Okay, and lastly, I'll speak about the long-term vision. Um, right now, we're limited to binary classification. We're looking actively to, um, to amend this library and to improve it to have multi-class classification. Um, we're adding uh, custom Earth observation data formats. Right now, we have a specific set that is particularly, particularly advantageous to agriculture data, um, but so uh, it, it's not uh, difficult for us to amend this program such that it can use any sort of earth engine uh, catalog. We also don't have the spatial dimension currently. We, we have found that focusing on the temporal dimension, the time dimension in the satellite imagery is what's key for most agriculture applications. Um, but for other applications, the spatial dimension may be important. So that's something that we'll be adding in. And the main point with our long-term vision is, is uh, really looking at widespread adoption by the community. We want to ensure that machine learning projects um, that are using remote sensing data actually go all the way and end up creating a map and don't just stop at, at the metric. And so uh, widespread adoption of this package would, would definitely help with that. Next slide. Okay, and so this is uh, this is Open Map Flow. It's a library for rapid map creation, with machine learning, and Earth observation data. There's two links here, and both of them were posted in the chat. The first one is the actual library code and documentation. Uh, the next one is is um, is the repository, which includes um, which uses the library to make cropland maps. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Ivan. That was really fascinating to learn more about the machine learning applications. So up next, we'll hear about a feasibility study in the Maipo River Valley um, from Rishu Dakur, a participant with one of our capacity building programs develop. Hello everyone, thanks Tyler. So today I'll be talking about our uh, developer project that we did uh, titled Determining Crop Coefficients Using Remote Sensing for Maipo River Valley Basin in Chile. So for this project, I worked with my team lead, Benjamin Goffa, Duncan Sersik, and Sarah Carlos, and our advisors, Dr. Winkat Raman Lakshmi and Dr. Kenton Ross. Next slide, please. So talking about the region, so the region, as I mentioned earlier, is the uh, Maipo River Basin in Chile, and it is actually the region which consists of the capital city, Santiago. So here, just talking about this region a bit, so it has been experiencing mega droughts and uh, due to climate change and uh, the region has a Mediterranean climate. And so there's, there's are issues of water security and therefore the irrigated agriculture is at risk in this region. So this region actually has a population of 7 million uh, inhabitants and contributes 44% to the GDP of Chile. And one of the major economic drivers in this region is uh, agriculture itself. So what we have done is we have used the uh, NASA Earth observation data sets to calculate crop coefficients, which are site specific. Currently, the crop coefficients that we utilize are made up by food and agriculture organization. But the problem is that those are those do not adhere to the geography and climate of Santiago. What that means is that it can, uh, using those generalized coefficients might lead to overestimation or underestimation of crop water requirements. And in a region like Chile, where already there is, uh, which is experiencing extreme water scarcity, it is very crucial to establish site-specific crop coefficients. So next slide, please. So what we did was we developed a methodology which, where we looked at the NDVI, which we calculated from the Landsat 8 observations. And here you can see that this spatial plot portrays the growing season for corn. And you can see that we were actually re, uh, able to capture the different growing uh, growth stages for corn over the growing period. And here we use this to, uh, we fitted a linear regression model with KC and we were actually able to establish a relation between NDVI and KC where knowing the NDVI value we could know what the KC uh, value is. So just adding what crop coefficient means is crop coefficient helps us to establish what the irrigation water requirement for a crop would be. 
So here we studied this relation for eight different sites located all over the basin, and we produced one uh, regional model which was able to explain the different microclimates uh, in the region that we studied. And we validated that, that at four locations. Next slide, please. So here, uh, just to explain the plot on the left, I would say that if we use the conventional crop coefficients which food and agriculture organization has developed so the water requirement would be depicted by the gray line here but if we uh, use the site specific coefficients that we derived using the et uh, based on the normalized difference to vegetation index basically uh, in other words remote sensing data sets from nasa we see that the uh, water requirement would be actually be reduced so potentially we would be saving water and in a region like chile where it's already extreme water scarcity is being experienced this actually uh, could lead to better um, water management in the region so we this data this study actually shows the potential that especially in regions uh, like chile all over the world where data is not available we can use these remote sensing approaches to uh, assess the actual irrigation needs and thus informing the water management. And here I would like to acknowledge our partners, uh, on-site partners Siren and the Embassy of Chile, without the, whose support this wouldn't have been possible. And yeah, so I would like to end off with that. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Rashid. Uh, next, please welcome Philo Gomez uh, from one of our other capacity building programs, Servir, who will share more about their STEM engagement in Bhutan. Hi there. Um, thank you very much for the, the opportunity to share my work. And um, yeah, so continue. I'm Philo Gomez. I'm the Servir uh, Fellow Project for the Bhutan Project. And if we can advance on the slides, I think we have heard a bit about the, the, the slides uh, from the previous presentation about our presentation. It seems like we skipped one slide. Uh, if we can go back. If we can go back to the previous slide, uh, I think the next slide. Oh, oh, you're not seeing it. Okay, uh, let's go back to the to the previous one with the, the graph. This one. Well, the previous slide is but missing here. It's the that locates the project on what we're doing here, um, here in Bhutan. As we have learned from previous uh, presenters, from my several colleagues, uh, from Dr. Emil Cherenton and Kelsey Herndon and Christine uh, from SCAP. Uh, yesterday, Servir uh, collaborates globally uh, across its partner hubs and in six different uh, uh, locations. Different, and uh, so what we, what 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 we do is uh, collaborate uh, with our partners directly through hubs and so on. Um, in this project, in regard to Bhutan, uh, it comes specifically in the in the. So I use my camera uh, in the, the project that was proposed by Serbir Globe and uh, develop a project which is uh, called uh, Advancing Science, Technology and Engineering uh, in Math through Increasing uh, Earth Observation cap Capacity in Bhutan. So this project, it's, um, it's there are three programs uh, uh, participating in Bhutan and where they uh, uh, bring uh, these kind of technologies to Use utilizing earth observations for the improvement uh, for predicting, uh, uh, addressing partners' need. And so, if, as we can see here, uh, uh, so as you can see here, this is the timeline of the project and when it was funded and so on. So the stage, the stage, or one of the differences that uh, Servir distinguishes within the its uh, uh, with other programs is that um, it's a partnership, it's a co-development, co it's a uh, inquiring uh, uh, address to address uh, participants need uh, okay so there is the service development within the the process workflow and where the partners are consulted and where they pro provide feedback and to address their their specific needs so so in the second um, uh, um, arrow that we see here in the previous slide please if we can go, to, go back to the previous slide so Servir in this project as i mentioned uh, with three projects, but also three of the main tasks that Sevier does is one is service development, as we can see here in the first uh, uh, row, and then the second row is the STEM engagement when it when it comes to uh, Sevier partnering 
uh, we develop a program in where we have uh, Shabir has, in, in conjunction with Develop, has provided six uh, uh, Develop projects. Now, first was with, within the water resources, and this is the second term of the agricultural monitoring, specifically looking at the rice, you know, in, in which our Develop uh, participants will present their work here after I end with my presentation. Uh, and the other thing what Servir does is uh, does capacity building in where we are uh, providing trainings and and remote sensing and utilize Google Earth Engine and so on. Yeah. So uh, as I mentioned a bit uh, in the service development, it's it's uh, um, the focus of Servir, a focus on, on agriculture and food security, water and uh, water related disasters, as you can see here. But also there's the, the process of the of how we uh, uh, connect with our partners in where there's a problem identification in where we uh, uh, learn from their needs and and then from there um, provide that hopefully the solution and the ultimate uh, of the product that or the service development gets produced that that, that can can have an impact. You no, know? and here in the in the lower uh, uh, lines or the arrow that that kind of shows pretty much like the the time flow or the process of the workflow that Servir does. You no, know? it doesn't mean that it's linear. Sometimes we have to come back to the to review our initial assessment needs, uh, service design, and then uh, as think um, changes, and also Servir is very mindful in the in the in concern the, in in practice the, the th theory of change and how a project changes over time and how it needs to be addressed and needs and wants from the partners. You know, because the ultimately goal is to provide. Um, uh, a product that it's meaningful to the to, to the partners. Next slide, please. So, as one of the example on the STEM engagement and this, uh, uh, like what I mentioned before, that of the three uh, sections that how Servir is engaging within Bhutan uh, is the the full series of developed projects that uh, Servir partnered or did with a develop program is the addressing the water resources one and two, three, in in where this application is already in um, uh, go interface is already in the process to be publishing. And then the ultimate goal is that the partners can utilize, improve it and and have a, a tool that they can utilize and to predict their to understand more of what is going on or happening on the ground. In the case of what is for the second uh, Topic of the second, 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 second section of the agriculture uh, one and the and the agriculture two that it's ending uh, today in this term summer 2022. Uh, again, we are creating um, uh, a GUI in where the partners can utilize this product in order to monitor the change and understand what is happening on the ground, but also be able to uh, uh, to to predict and and see and share and visualize their, the changes in the agricultural arena and what's taking place. Next slide, please. So, and also in the service cap and the capacity building is, um, Servir has, um, provides uh, training too. During the COVID, we have uh, done uh, two online trainings uh, so far since my term started, and there's uh, three more trainings, uh, upcoming trainings that is coming and directly addressing the needs of, of our partners. And the, so, uh, so, and one one other thing that um, from the partners, what we have learned, or the people who are participate in this participate in this training, they are um, very uh, 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 they appreciate they they understand there's they they understand the value of the importance of training and utilizing and new automatizing uh, uh, crop predictions and utilizing the resources that is available in, for example, the Google Earth Engine in in there, there's no fancy uh, application or fancy computer that is needed in order to process the uh, earth observations data and so on. Uh, so if we can go to the next slide, please. So uh, again, um, from the from this uh, proposal project that uh, Globe and uh, Development Servir uh, proposed, and it was fund funded by the Department of State, uh, at least uh, we, they were, the goal was to have uh, 30 primary and secondary tra training uh, comp complete. 
and where at least there were develop uh, uh, in the developed participants there were 12 Bhutanese scholars participating in the develop uh, project in where Serbia uh, improved one at least one capacity as of now uh, and the current status is uh, globe has provided more than 50 uh, primary and secondary trainings and completed in Bhutan you know, and within the develop uh, and severe um, uh, collaboration in the addressing the develop programs there are, there are 15 uh, Bhutanese scholars who have participated in this uh, uh, developed term in Serbia uh, has already uh, one uh, completed the application but then the other one is on the way in in the terms of the food and agricultural monitoring and so on. So those are the kind of the things that Servir is doing and on top of that the service development and capacity building how how this um, knowledge how this um, stem engagement uh, that all these three globe and develop and Servir is doing the hope is that how they how the partners can implement and adapt and make it their own and, and move from there and so on. So that's what I, that's the, the status. I think we will hear more about from the partic from the particip from the developed participants themselves. So learn more about the, as one of the examples on what Servir and develop and other programs are collaborating and to bring in uh, earth observations data into Bhutan. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Philo, for outlining the great work Sabir is doing in Bhutan. Um, and yes, to share more about DEVELOP's uh, work with Bhutan, I'll pass it off to the Bhutan Agriculture 2 team of Wangdrak Dorji, Tenzing Wangmo, Sanam Selden Shering, and Karma Dorji for our final presentation of the agriculture session. Thank you, Tyler. Um, hello, everyone. We are NASA DEVELOP's Bhutan Agriculture 2 team. So in the 10-week develop program, we created a graphical user interface, crop mass, and data collection protocol for the analysis of rice in Bhutan uh, using remotely sensed data. Next slide, please. Uh, for this term, the team aimed to uh, expand the overall research area covered in Bhutan in order to produce a more robust crop mask for rice and tune the random force model parameters to yield optimal for performance in creating the crop mask. Other objectives were to create a graphical user interface for the crop analysis by streamlining the previous term's data collection protocol for ease of use and generalizability to any crop. Uh, ultimately, the objectives and goals for the term were uh, were meant to aid and uh, were meant to aid the decision making process of our partners. Next slide, please. Google Earth Engine, the team developed a model of rice, class, rice, rice mass classification using the random forest class for the year, for the year of 2015 to 2020. After that, the team aggregated the crop mass images for each year from the month of May to October by applying weights. The above map is the aggregate of months for the year of 2020. The orange dot here represents the rice areas in the country for the year of 2020. To give you a better understanding on how the random forest model works, We'll zoom into one of the random rice regions that we collected the points from to give an overview of it. The left slide gives you a normal map of power region. We have classified the areas into water bodies like rivers, urban like set up settlements like houses and buildings, and vegetations like bushes and trees, and lastly the rice fields. On the right side, you can see the results of our RF model. The orange is the rice mass, which can be seen only covering the rice fields accurately, but not the rivers, houses, and the vegetations. Next slide, please. Um, so within uh, Collector Auto Online, the team randomly sampled uh, points within the five major rice producing districts of Bhutan. Each point was classified manually into rice and uh, non-rice points. So these points were uh, then imported within uh, imported to Google Earth Engine, where the team split it into training, validation, and testing sets. Within uh, Earth Engine, the team also computed various indices to aid in the classification by the random forest model. So these include slope and elevation uh, from SRTM, the optical indices from Landsat 8 OLI, the tassel cap transformation indices from Landsat 8 to data, and the SAR polarization indices from the using the Sentinel-1 CSAR data. So the team also used uh, pre-existing data sets within uh, uh, earth engine uh, with bands uh, such as the height above nearest drainage, precipitation, temperature, and canopy interception. 
So using these indices, the crop maps was generated and we uh, basically used many statistics as well to, um, uh, to validate the performance and uh, tune the model further. So the crop mask was then generated for months of May to October from every year uh, from 2015 and 2020 applying different weights each month. And the team then uh, used the crop layer band from uh, regional land cover monitoring system RLCMS for the Hindu Kush Himalaya region to clip out uh, further noise from other land features such as glaciers and um, barren soil. So then the aggregated crop masks were used within uh, the graphical user interface to display trends and statistics. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a this is the on the left hand side. You can see an image of our uh, satellite image of uh, zoomed in um, uh, rice field in Paro, one of the Zonkaks. And on the right hand side, you can see uh, our random forest uh, model applied to that image where the orange highlighted um, highlights um, areas of rice field cover. Um, next slide, please. So the aggregated rice masks from the random forest model were then used to create a graphical user interface. <clears throat> this enables our end users to access the crop mask and statistics on rice distribution without requiring prior experience with Google Earth Engine. By choosing an area and year of interest, the interface would immediately update and produce time series graphs such as rice distribution and um, rice area distribution as well. Um, furthermore, this uh, we can, it also updates to produce a supplementary graph to compare trends for various parameters such as temperature, soil moisture, and NDVI. Uh, next slide, please. So for uh, the team successfully developed the aggregated crop mass for each year from 2015 to 2020 in all the districts of the country. And what we noticed was there was an increase from increase in the rice area from 2015 to 2017, but there was a gradual decrease until 2020. So our model also predicted 2019 to have the lowest rice area of 63,098 acres and 2017 to have the highest rice area of 97,789 acres. However, the actual statistics recorded by the Department of Agriculture was a little different, where uh, 2016 was the actual year with the highest rice area. So it showed that our um, data was overclassifying regions. Um, last, uh, secondly, the diverse rice ecosystem, eco ecosystem across different altitudes make the process of mapping rice really difficult to tolerate noise from different environmental features. So we found that given a limited uh, data set to train the model, using available maps for other land features such as glaciers and water bodies to clip the monthly rice maps helps to reduce noise from uh, in the aggregated map. Lastly, our random forest model had an average accuracy of 85.9% and a Kappa score of 71.8%. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, team, um, as well as to all of our other presenters today for sharing your work. And thank you uh, to everyone else for joining us today. If you're interested in learning more about the programs that were discussed, uh, please see the links that have been posted in the chat. If you'd like to watch the presentations again, uh, or if you happen to miss any part of it, the recordings and slides will be posted on the Applications Week website after the event. Uh, coming up next, we hope that you'll join us for the Disasters Applications Overview and Highlights session. Once again, thank you all for being here today. everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining the Disasters Applications Overview and Highlight Sessions today as part of the 2022 NASA Earth Science Applications Week. Uh, my name is Caroline Williams and I'm a fellow with the NASA Developed National Program at our pop-up location and I will be your MC for this session. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce you all to our first speaker, Dr. Shanna McLean, who will share an overview of the Disasters Program. Okay, perfect. Sorry, everyone, for the delay. Um, I had a little issue becoming unmuted, but um, 
hopefully everything is working now. So um, hello to everyone, um, wherever you are in the world. Uh, it's a sincere pleasure to participate in Earth Science Applications Week and to be able to share the exciting work that's being done across the disasters program with all of you. My name is Shana McLean and I'm the disasters program manager. Um, before I dive into the next slides on the disasters program and, and what we do and what we're all about, I want to just provide some brief opening remarks on the nature of disasters and the vision that I have for what the disasters program will achieve hopefully over this year and years to come. So the nature of our connected world means that shocks, stresses and crises stemming from climate change, uh, things like ecosystem fragility, poorly planned or unplanned urbanization and political and financial instability across multiple governance levels create large scale and global impacts. Disasters occur when natural hazards such as droughts and flooding, cold and heat waves, hurricanes and wildfire directly impact lives and livelihoods, often forcibly displacing large populations or leading to large migration events. Disasters also discriminate. They disproportionately affect the most vulnerable populations, especially the poorest, which is why a whole of community approach is needed so that gender, age, disability, and culture are integrated into disaster management activities. We know that as populations increase, more people are placed at risk, and that because of increased development and climate change, the disasters are occurring more often, they're hitting us all harder, and they're lasting much longer. Disasters do not have to devastate. If we can begin focusing more on improving our understanding of disaster risk, implementing preparedness and anticipatory action efforts, and integrating risk into recovery outcomes, we can begin building more resilient communities around the world. For all these reasons, my vision for the disasters program is to create an inclusive and interdisciplinary program that can better understand the complexities of the human and environmental interactions that lead to disasters and crises. This will require advancing our knowledge of the social, economic, and physical factors that increase exposure and vulnerability, expanding our focus to include current and future impacts from disasters, such as changes to livelihoods, disaster displacement and migration, and finally, better integrating climate change into how we model future disaster impacts so that we can build more resilient and climate smart communities. Next slide, please. So with this vision in mind, the disaster program intends to approach these complex and systemic challenges through three primary pathways. These include the disasters applications portfolio, our disaster response coordination capabilities, and finally through partnerships and engagement in open science. The applications portfolio exists to not only advance our understanding of disasters and improve the decisions that reduce the risk of and build resilience to disasters, but also to better understand how these disasters create loss and damage and what that means for communities around the world. The disaster response coordination component is intended to bring cutting edge science applications and technologies to those working in disaster response and emergency management fields. So they have the most accurate information available to support their decisions on where to evacuate families, where to place food and emergency supplies, or where there may be additional cascading threats as fires can lead to debris flow and landslides, or as flooding may lead to chemical or toxic releases. Finally, the partnership and open science component is focused on connecting with partners who want to use our applications to advance how they make decisions, how they prepare for disasters and how they build resilience. Our program manages a disasters portal, which is focused on providing transparency in the work that we do across the program, on making our data and data products accessible and open to all interested, and with the intent of building the capacity of our partners to reproduce or integrate um, our work into their own management efforts. Next slide, please. Okay, so now I'm gonna dive just a bit deeper into each of the three programmatic pathways I just mentioned before I turn things over to the incredible team of experts working within the disasters program who will provide in-depth examples of everything I'm talking about. So this is just a broad overview so you can become acquainted with all that we do. 
And so this slide reflects our current disaster applications portfolio, um, which supports actively 10 projects focused on improving the understanding of disaster risk across a variety of hazards. And when I'm talking about understanding disaster risk, what I mean is that we are looking at both the hazard itself, how it changes over time, as well as um, how it impacts the issues of exposure, as well as vulnerability. Seven of our projects work with partners from across the US government, such as USGS, NOAA, USDA, and others. We also work from private sector or with private sector insurance firms and with NGOs in order to assess the risk of certain hazards, including flooding, landslides, volcanoes, fire, hailstorms, and tsunamis. We also have projects that improve our understanding of impacts to critical infrastructure and assess the amount of damage to communities and industries from disasters. Finally, we also advance the understanding of technical and industrial accidents, for example, through our oil spill monitoring and damage assessment work. Again, all of these will be examples that are coming up shortly. Next slide, please. On our response coordination effort, we connect experts across seven NASA centers to ensure that during a major disaster event, our team can support partners from the United Nations, from the US government, and international governments around the world, from NGOs and more with the most up-to-date information. Last year alone, we supported 12 domestic and 31 international disasters, including tropical cyclones, volcanic eruptions, flooding, and fires. And in the next few months, it will be exciting to see um, as we open a new disaster response coordination office at, an, at NASA so that we can improve how we advance our science and technical capabilities to not only provide critical information during disasters, but to also learn from our partner agencies and organizations so that we can adapt our capabilities over time to meet the needs of those that we work with most closely. Next slide, please. Finally, to understand a bit more about the work done across the disasters program, please visit our disasters portal. I'll place the link in chat. It's also reflected on this slide, but you here you can find a variety of data and data products available on current active and past disaster events, as well as stories like this one on the screen, which illustrates the variety of partners that we collaborate with, the different types of earth science information available to support disaster management, and stories that explain the applications to build capacity and interest in understanding the critical role Earth observations play for increasing our understanding of disasters and supporting the critical decisions for managing them. I'm gonna stop here, but I wanna thank you all for spending the last few minutes with me and learning more about the disasters program. Um, as I've mentioned a few times, I'm really excited for the next set of presentations, which will give you examples from across the disasters team um, on the elements that I've discussed with you today. Carolyn, back over to you. Thank you, Dr. McLean, for that excellent overview and highlight of the valuable work being accomplished at the NASA Applied Sciences Disasters Program. Next, please welcome Robert Emerson, who will be presenting on landslide susceptibility and exposure. Thank you so much, Caroline, and thank you to Shana. Uh, thank you to all of you. I'm really excited to be here. This is my second year presenting as part of Applied Sciences Week, um, and I really enjoy it. I think it's nice to be able to talk to the community. Um, I'm going to give you a brief overview of some of the work we've been doing as part of the landslides research at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, and really linking to what Shana was saying about how we're not just looking at hazard, but we're thinking about how it affects people infrastructure as well. So um, next slide, please. So, just a brief introduction to some terms that we might be thinking about in terms of disasters. Um, I'm gonna phrase this in terms of landslides because it's what I'm most familiar with. Um, but for example, if we think about susceptibility, which is a term you might hear a lot about, that might mean where the landslide is likely. So where in the landscape we might expect a landslide to happen. Um, hazard is where and when the landslide is likely. And that's what you often hear in disaster response um, discussions is, is the likelihood of a specific hazard occurring in a specific time and place. But what may be more important to people in infrastructure is the exposure. So who or what is in that zone of hazard? Um, we can add to that this concept of vulnerability, which is how likely is damage or injury to occur as a result of a given level of exposure. And then finally, this kind of intangible but hard to kind of get by, get to concept of risk, which is the multiplication of hazard exposure and vulnerability. Um, we think about this quite scientifically, but it's worth pointing out that it's 
NASA and all of other agencies are really good at getting at hazard, but we're not so good at getting to exposure, vulnerability and risk. And in particular, understanding how people are in the hazard zones, who they are and what their demographics are, is something we're really working to develop more about. Um, so it's, it's an exciting new topic. So next slide, please. So I've got some examples of the landslide models we've developed. Um, we have a global model called uh, the Landslide Hazard Assessment for Situational Awareness, or LASA model, um, which is built on a sort of a susceptibility map. And you can see an example here for Southeast Asia. Um, it then provides both a forecast and a nowcast. Um, it will be a, which in other words, tells us where and when hazard is likely around the world, both daily in near real time, but also with a one day and two day lead for forecasting. So in other words, at a one kilometer resolution, we can predict where landslides are likely to occur. And this is now available in Google Earth Engine, which enables people to reproduce this and reuse it in their own settings for um, specific applications. But again, what about the people in infrastructure who might be in harm's way? So if we go to the next slide, please. Some of the work we've been doing has been developed to start filling in these gaps and exposure for landslide estimates. Um, so this is an image from a paper we published a couple of years ago that looks at uh, combining a global population data set with our global estimate of where landslides are most likely. So we have 20 years worth of, of, rate of estimates of where landslides induced by rainfall are likely to occur. And we can combine that with this population data set to pick out the locations around the world where population exposure is likely to be very high. And you can see that you might expect landslides occurring in the Himalayas and China and the Alps and particularly the Andes. But there are also parts of sub-Saharan Africa which there is very limited reporting of landslides um, in the English language media. And so if you're just looking at that to understand where hazards are occurring, you might miss this. And so this is one thing that satellite data allows us to do better than any other data sources to build this globally consistent picture. If we go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> one other thing it allows us to do is to look at things on a seasonal or for the monthly basis. So because we have rainfall data from the last 20 years using satellite data, we can basically look at how um, the number of landslides predicted, uh, triggered by rainfall is likely to change over the course of a year in a given location. So I picked out three specific locations around the world, one in China in uh, Chenzhou province, one in Northern India in Canal province, and one in Colombia in Planadas um, per uh, a municipality. And the reason for this is you can look at uh, on these little graphs below, the change in exposure to landslides of people um, over the course of a year. And um, so the, the timer is, the months are on the x-axis here on the, bottom, the bottom axis and the exposure is on the y-axis going upwards. As you can see in some months there are higher levels of exposure and some months there are lower levels of exposure. But the key thing here that we found out is when we connect this to the El Nino Southern Oscillation, which you might be aware of as just El Nino, um, we can see there are significant changes in how many people are exposed as a result of El Nino. Um, so if we go to the next slide please. What this allowed us to do is to look at how um, the exposure populations changes around the world depending on the El Nino state. Um, so in blue colors here, um, population exposure decreases when El Nino is at high levels and it increases when it's um, at the opposite end, a La Nina condition. And red and orange colors here indicate the opposite. And the reason this is exciting is that we can make estimates of what the El Nino state will look like in the climate system um, over six to 12 months in the future. And this also means we can make predictions about how likely landslide impacts are going to be, the exposure of population to landslides, how that's going to change due to El Nino. And this is the first way in which we're able to kind of provide a seasonal prediction of landslide impacts in different countries around the world. And in parts of Southeast Asia, where you can see there are significant changes as a result of uh, El La Nino conditions, and in Colombia and, and, and Central America, this is really relevant. It allows us to draw to these to tell governments that they might want to prioritize their um, operations to prevent landslides during those peak years of El Nino. And again, this is a really nice global consistent picture of this. The next steps for us are to develop a kind of uh, how vulnerability fits into this. Oh, sorry, please go to the next slide. <coughs> is to develop the vulnerability. Um, but we're also looking at infrastructure as well. And this is just a snapshot from Rio de Janeiro, where we've worked with the city government there um, to look at how roads are exposed to landslides. Um, this map just shows a long-term estimate of the hazard associated with landslides for given roads through the city of Rio. And this is really high resolution. This has been something we've done using local data, but using global NASA data as well to inform this. And this is a real great example of how we can use large-scale global data sets, but also work very locally to develop this kind of exposure assessment 
that really impacts the lives of people on the ground in Rio de Janeiro. And this could be applied elsewhere as well. So we're excited about this and I'm really hoping that we can talk more about it. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out in the chat. I'll be here for the rest of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for that insightful overview of landslide, hazard risk, and exposure. Next, please welcome Shana Salas and Ricardo Quiroga for a project highlight on visualizing multi-risk or multi-hazard risk in Central America. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. Can you put the first slide, please? Okay, uh, you can handle the risk that you don't know. That is my, my first sentence. Uh, this project is one sample how NASA disaster program can articulate the community and with different stakeholders to combine data, intentions, to understand the risk, uh, uh, which is the one, the priority number one of the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. NASA role is playing here to combine information, expertise, data, local knowledge, and also final products to make decisions in understanding the risk of the Guatemala City. We combine information from CEPRADENAC, which is the Regional Coordination for Central America for Disasters, Central American Integration System countries, local emergency management agencies, NASA Disaster Program, NAPTECA, Salve Terra, who is uh, providing uh, an study on multi hazards for that region in high resolution. Yeah, this uh, I'm using this slide only to highlight this this effort because NASA disaster program can be continue uh, continue articulating the efforts and also stakeholders in the Americas. I will pass the voice to Shana Solis. Thank you. Thank you so much. So as Ricardo. Uh, did, uh, stated in his introduction, uh, this was really an effort to interpret a multi-hazard uh, risk analysis that was done by Salvatera. And after doing a webinar uh, during the pandemic, when everything was shut down, uh, we did a webinar in Spanish for many different countries. The city of Guatemala came forward and asked for some assistance in interpreting that multi-hazard risk analysis. Next slide. Uh, they really, you know, had a lot of very critical information, but it needed to be reinterpreted in a visual format to make it relevant and understandable. So it could also be thought of as actionable for decision making processes. Next slide. This project really built on uh, many years of R&D that we've been very grateful to have support from NASA's Applied Sciences Program and originally also from the NASA ESTO program to really push the envelope and explore how immersive technologies using game engine and virtual and augmented reality could potentially be applied for science data visualization, really taking NASA's data products, model output, Earth observation information, remote sensing, and putting them into a framework that could be understood by people from many different backgrounds, not just from a scientific research perspective. One of those, those early projects was actually using the API to connect the NASA Disaster Applications Mapping Portal to our game engine and bring data in near real time into the virtual reality headset. Next slide. Next. So these multi-hazard risk analyses contain critical information, uh, you know, talking about understanding risk, understanding that susceptibility, and then with the Sendai framework, which you see here, you know, really having this outline of how people can put into action the recommendations. But these documents are very dense. They can be 70, 100 pages. That can be very difficult for a civil engineer or a city planner or a mayor to understand and put into action. Next. So by using the uh, information that was contained in the analysis, so this is an example of that type of map. So you have you know, information about the seismic risk for Guatemala City, very critical to understand, but really we needed to put it within the context so that those types of stakeholders could put that information into a decision-making process. Next. The first step, um, next slide. So Guatemala City, you know, is a is a modern city. You know, many millions of people live there, and they face multiple hazards from volcanoes, from 
seismic uh, susceptibility, also tropical storms and cyclones, which can lead to landslides and flooding, all the risks they have them. Next slide. One of the areas that they particularly wanted us to look at was um, seismic risk and activity. Their last major earthquake occurred in 1976 and the return period being over, that was top of mind for everyone is could we really interpret the information from that study that was done and also bring in lots of different data layers, population, understanding what the impacts would be and put that into the game engine using our 3D capabilities all of the visualization techniques that we had developed to help them understand those study results better. Next slide. So the pilot project, you know, used um, a lot of different types of information, which we're going to see here. Um, it was funded by NASA disasters in part, and then also developed in Unity Game Engine. Next slide. The first step was to build up the terrain. Uh, we used ArcGIS based ma maps and models for that terrain. And then also it turned out from meeting with the different stakeholders that they had some additional 3D assets that we could use. The Catastro is the property management uh, part of their local government. And they actually had 3D building models that were used for taxation. We were able to bring them into the game engine environment to help build up uh, a very realistic model for Guatemala City. Next slide. The other key component was bringing in those fault lines and locating them correctly from a geospatial sense. So again, being able to give people that situational awareness and take what had been just lines and dots on a map and put it into the context of the modern city was a critical first step. Next slide. Uh, if you could just put up the picture. So this is about the impacts on the people. And just as our previous presenter was seeing, you know, we really need to understand what is their exposure to risk? What is their susceptibility to these different disasters? Next slide. So in that sense, one of the NASA data sets that could provide that additional context is the Socioeconomic Data and Applications Center data, known as CDAC. We were able to bring that in as a key data layer so that we could really start seeing the impacts to the population. And you'll see that in my next slide. Next. Um, the city wanted to really understand, you know, what would be the impacts to the population and also to key infrastructure, such as the international airport and that main corridor where most of this um, economic activity takes place in the city center. Next slide. And if you could play the video. So that seismic risk starts to become clear. Here we're seeing the yellow fault lines um, overlaid with that 3D terrain. We're flying into the international airport. We're seeing those 3D models. And then the red coloration that you're seeing in the background is actually from that NASA CDAC data set, which shows us that high population density right in the city center. So now this picture starts to become clear. We see how the fault lines crisscross that center city corridor. We can see local landmarks and give us a frame of reference, such as being able to see a local football stadium or other areas of interest. So now we start getting that aha moment when we show this to stakeholders, because now they have these reference points that they live and breathe every day, and they can see the scientific data and information layered on top. Next slide, please. Another area that's crucial to understand for this region is landslides. Next slide. So there was a lot of landslide data um, contained in the study and uh, similar to what the previous presenter was talking about, you know, there are many NASA data products which are relevant, uh, one being the land Global Landslide Nowcast, which is updated every three hours. So this was actually a huge achievement for our team because this is near real-time data that is constantly being updated. So to be able to bring this into the game engine framework, look at it in virtual reality if you want to, you know, and have that real-time information could be the first step towards really building this into a decision-making tool. Remember, this is all R&D, it's not operational. These are just the baby steps to get to that point and proving that these are technologies that could be used in this way. Yeah. Next slide, please. So of course, landslides can lead to floods. Uh, this area is also susceptible to major storms. Next slide. We wanted to bring in flood data layers. This is an example of taking that information from the, uh, yeah, it's a video if you can play, uh, taking the information from the Salvatierra risk 
analysis and then putting it into the game engine and again providing that context. Let's just move to the next slide for the sake of time. So here we can see almost like our risk selfies from that region. So we can see the seismic risk with the fault lines um, up your upper right. You see actually volcanic risk for the region. Then we can see the landslide and flooding risk. And these are all layers that can be turned on and off in that virtual environment. So you can see how you can build up lots of different types of layers to provide you overall context for the region, taking all of the output from any of the different studies that you've heard about today and bringing them into one visual framework that many people from different backgrounds can look at, collaborate on, and use for decision making. Next slide. We do think that these might be techniques that can help improve readiness and resilience. We can give people access to the data and information that's out there and put it into a way, a visual framework, um, so that they can really use it and understand it. Next slide. If you play the video, you can see how that all comes together. We take all of the cinematography of, cin cinematography of the game engine. These are techniques that are used for games, but we can actually use them for real world information. The 3D terrain, flying into this international airport, we see the yellow fault lines, we can turn our data layers on and off. We can even change things like day and night and other weather, you know, really bringing in all kinds of layers and levels of realism to help people really understand all of the different contextual information that they need to be better prepared and build resiliency in the region. Next slide. In fact, it was very exciting that our visualizations were actually used in a real world exercise in Guatemala City last February, for the Central American Earthquake Simulation Drill. The visualizations seen here in their emergency operations center were actually used to provide situational awareness for seven different visiting countries and the United Nations for that event. Next slide. In conclusion, we think that gaming engine technology, along with the possibility to view it in immersive frameworks, can help increase resiliency, help us visualize and plan for extreme weather, disasters, and climate change. And we look forward to continuing this collaboration with NASA Disasters and Applied Sciences. Thank you. Thank you, Shana and Ricardo, for that excellent talk. Next, we will transition into discussion on active fires, including fire directionality and impact with Kyle Hilburn. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be here and greetings from Colorado. I'm Kyle Hilburn. I'm the lead PI on the Wildfire Project. Uh, I would like to acknowledge my uh, co-PIs, uh, Adam Kochansky, who's at the Wildfire Interdisciplinary Research Center at San Jose State University, uh, and Jan Mondel at the Math Department at CU Denver. Next slide, please. So the motivation for this work is, well, turn on the news any given night. Uh, our planet is on fire. Uh, when I put these slides together a few weeks ago, it was the Oak Fire near Yosemite. That's fortunately 90% contained right now, but after burning 19,000 acres. Uh, since then, we've had the McKinney Fire, which has burned 6, uh, 60,000 acres near the Oregon border. And in the last few days, the Six Rivers Lightning Complex Fire uh, in Humboldt and Trinity counties it's already burned 12,000 acres. These lightning uh, complexes, fires start everywhere and, and is incredibly challenging to respond to. So we're living in the era of million acre wildfires. Uh, the August complex is one example. The Dixie fire almost uh, reached a million acres. And fires have become large enough and hot enough that they can create their own weather. Uh, and it's leading to extreme fire behavior uh, that people haven't seen before, uh, pyroconvection, uh, uh, fire tornadoes and, and other extreme behavior such as that. So why is this happening? Uh, well, a drought is a, is a big reason why. Uh, it's creating a landscape that's more fire prone. Uh, the New Mexico fires earlier this year, uh, where the Hermit's Peak and Calf Canyon fires burned uh, over 300,000 acres in New Mexico, it was directly related to the extreme drought conditions, uh, as are the monster fires in France right now. Uh, in addition to that, we have population growth across the wildland urban interface. And we're finding out uh, the Marshall Fire in Boulder on December 30th, it was just a grass fire, but it showed that that risk is, is much closer to us than, than many of us thought. And so all these factors point for the need of high resolution and rapidly updating information about the weather, uh, the fire and the smoke information. Next slide, please. 
So you may have heard of the uh, fire triangle or combustion triangle where you need fuel, oxygen, and heat to create fire. Uh, in wildland uh, fire settings, there's another triangle of fuels, weather, and topography. Uh, so as far as the fuels go, uh, that's determined by, by the thickness of the fuels and fine fuels such as grass and brush can dry out very quickly. Uh, so fire risk is never that far away in time. Um, and then there's the weather component of which the winds are, are the most significant component. Uh, the, in Southern California, you have Santa Ana winds in the valleys. And in Northern California, you have Diablo winds along the ridge tops that spread fires throughout wine country a few years ago. Uh, there are upslope and downslope winds in Colorado here. Downslope winds are incredibly powerful uh, and often associated with fire. But also fronts and convective outflow. This loop that you're watching uh, shows an example of wildfires, grass fires over Oklahoma. And you can see near the end of the loop, a pole front sweeps through and the fire quickly changes direction to the south. Uh, in addition to that convective outflow from nearby thunderstorms uh, can be uh, a major factor in shaping the direction of fire. And it can change things very rapidly. We'll remember that um, in 2013 in Arizona, 19 out of 20 of the Granite Mountain hotshots were killed in the Yarnell Hill fire uh, when a convective outflow boundary passed over the fire and quickly changed its direction. Uh, factors such as the temperature, the humidity and precipitation also uh, are important for the fuel moisture uh, and thus affect the fire behavior. And finally, there's topography. So uh, fire spread faster uphill because the flames are closer to the fuels and the fuels get preheated by the fire. So when you put these ingredients together, uh, you get the wildland fire uh, situation. Next slide, please. So how do we address these unprecedented fires? Uh, as part of our uh, wildfire project, we're using a state-of-the-art coupled model wharf S fire. You, know, you can see a diagram of the physical components right here. Uh, in this, you see that um, uh, heat and moisture fluxes in the red arrow from the fire spread model are feeding into the atmospheric model. And those are actually changing the winds. And those fire affected winds uh, then feed back into the fire model to affect the fire behavior. Uh, additionally, you have uh, the atmospheric fire model, the atmospheric model affected by the fire, uh, the air temperature, the humidity, and the precipitation uh, feeds into the fuel moisture, which also uh, controls the fire spread. And you also have a, a smoke emission model. So the, an advantage of coupled modeling uh, is that you have the plume dynamics are explicitly resolved uh, and also that the, the fuels, uh, the forest, uh, the brush is converted to smoke emissions. So you have a complete uh, carbon cycle uh, represented. Next slide, please. Now, uh, state-of-the-art fire model uh, its forecasts are only as good uh, as the observations that you have to initialize those forecasts. That's where satellite data are critical. Uh, in the left panel, you see an example of uh, satellite fire detections. Those are the squares. And you see perimeters being drawn around those squares uh, using machine learning. Uh, that's how we uh, encode the information into the WARFS fire model. You know, in the early uh, uh, hours of a new fire, satellite observations are usually the only source of information we have. Uh, but even during ongoing fires, satellite information provides critical up to the minute information that really does make an impact on uh, fire forecasts. So you combine the information from the satellite fire detections uh, with estimates of fuel moisture that WARFS fire uh, is producing using data simulation, and then you can produce fire and smoke forecasts. Next slide, please. So those fire and smoke forecasts uh, aren't useful until you can, unless you can get them to the users. Uh, we have a number of delivery mechanisms to handle the variety of different types of users that we're uh, interfacing with. Uh, we have a web-based interface, which you can see depicted in the loop uh, on the right side. We've also made our data available in the NASA disasters portal. Uh, currently, we're integrating ArcGIS. So the, the raster data that our uh, model creates are, has a very huge data volume. But using ArcGIS, you can distill that into a much smaller format, uh, which can be served more efficiently into the field uh, where uh, bandwidth is typically limited. We're also integrating a WARFS Fire into TechnoSilva Fire Analyst, uh, which is a uh, commercial software package that uh, professional fire managers use. And so there's many end users and partners uh, 
uh, with interest in, in fire and smoke forecasts, our, our number one partner is the U.S. Forest Service. As part of the disasters program, we've also provided a forecast to CAL FIRE and Cal California National Guard. Uh, a key use of these forecasts has been for deploying airborne assets. You don't want to move uh, aircraft into areas where they'll get smoked out and unable to uh, fly. Uh, in addition, air resource advisors and incident meteorologists for specific fires uh, find this guidance very helpful. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, uh, there's an increasing need for high resolution fire, smoke and weather information and coupled fire atmosphere, fuel and smoke models are essential to meeting those needs. Uh, when we started this project in 2019, people said you can't do coupled fire modeling. We've uh, at, at such a fast pace in an operational environment. We've shown that, yes, it is indeed possible and that it really does add value. And so the Warfest fire demonstrates the possibilities for the next generation of operational modeling systems. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kyle, for presenting on modeling the impact of active fires. Next, please welcome Charlie Hewick and Diana Chow to learn more about earthquake exposure and vulnerability. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, Charles Hike. I'm going to be talking about Global Economic and Disruption Index. Um, next slide, please. So we put together the, um, the Global Economic Disruption Index, or JEDI, to, um, to try to characterize a pretty unique problem. And that is uh, when you look at risk and the characterization of risk, it tends to be analyzed on a site-specific um, basis. But um, disasters have, um, are nonlinear, right? If you have a very large disaster, it will um, impact an economy um, for uh, potentially decades or at least years. If you have a small event, you might recover quite quickly. What happens is the, the ability to bounce back essentially gets overwhelmed. Um, and being able to, to characterize this economic um, impact or secondary impact is something that's not really taken into account when you're looking at a traditional uh, risk uh, framework like Robert was, was laying out. Um, so disasters have a tipping point. Essentially, the economies are able to bounce back more than anticipated. People help their neighbors, et cetera, until uh, you've got these cascading effects, which are often triggered by um, disasters in the manufacturing area or the critical infrastructure area. So we thought our moonshot idea was that maybe EO could be used to characterize potential for this long-term economic disruption. Next slide, please. Okay, so the, um, the basic theory is quite simple. We start from the notion that uh, you can see these areas, they're white in this uh, picture of um, Bangkok, Thailand here, where you've got two critical infrastructure and manufacturing. Next slide. You can detect them through um, segmentation, no surprise to this audience, I'm sure. There, here we've got them in blue on the outskirts of, uh, of town. Next slide. Once you've detected them, um, you're able to characterize, um, sorry, you're able to overlay it with um, global hazard data sets and figure out where you've got potentially uh, uh, problematic areas. So that's the hazard plus the exposure. That's what I was talking about. Next slide. And then that we get into sort of new territory where um, you use um, the production capacity that you're able to detect through uh, EO and start to damage um, the or impede the production based on the vulnerability and the resilience noted in the, in the given country and start to feed that into economic models to, to look at what the uh, cascading impacts might be. So a totally new paradigm for modeling um, that we were able to, um, to put together. Next slide. And one more. I covered that one too, I guess. Um, so we um, we had a we had a pilot program in India where we were able to prove this basic concept for three different types of disasters. One looking at um, probabilistic flood, um, so like a hundred year flood uh, throughout India, where there's the biggest accidents waiting to happen. Uh, one looking at actual typhoon that was uh, uh, approaching India using the um, Kineticast um, software, which. Diana will be talking about after me, um, look like uh, the areas that uh, we predicted would be the biggest impact uh, actually were. And uh, lastly, looking at climate conditioned uh, impacts. So predicted sea level rise in the future on top of coastal hazards where you would and, and predict the biggest uh, change moving forward. Next slide. 
So once we um, approve the basic theory, people are like, okay, that's great, but how good is it? Um, and what do these colors mean? Um, what can we tangibly use this for? So we went back to the drawing board and with that information that the basic modeling framework was working, we developed uh, JEDI, which was essentially a, a way of describing um, the, the magnitude of the impact, the economic impact in a given area, what the restoration would be like, what the impacts on the critical infrastructure would be like, what the economic impacts would be like. So we developed this, this very simple scale. Essentially it's um, you know, uh, hours to a day, days to a week, weeks to a month, months to a year, or many years. So um, we tried to make it, uh, we were we provided detail, this is only a part of it, but we wanted to make it also very simple so that it could be used potentially in, um, in media outlets. Next slide. So with, uh, with that scale, we used um, uh, hurricane data in the southeast of the US um, provided by Kinetic to, um, to be able to see how well we could, um, we could predict um, these type of impacts. So we used, uh, I think it was uh, six, seven of the past biggest hurricanes to hit this century and trained a model and then went back into the historic archive and, and saw how well we would be able to predict just on that one to five scale um, uh, previous events. And what we found is that we seem to do as good as the historic record uh, uh, would allow, which is pretty good. Uh, always within uh, within a single uh, ranking, so that's the uncertainty that we have. But you know, it's difficult to go back through um, reports and figure out exactly what the restoration was. But essentially, it's good enough to tell you what the magnitude of the impact uh, for any event um, uh, could be. So, next slide. Uh, we anticipate that this could be used uh, in an um, advisory capacity. That's one of the areas where we're most excited about it. Uh, and Diana will be talking about that uh, next with with her program. Uh, corporate, re corporate real estate uh, is already coming to us and we're already doing uh, projects for them. Um, be basically characterizing where the safest communities are for, for investment. Uh, I think it's a, it's a good extension to cap modeling technologies, which tend to just look at a property-based system. If you can do a probabilistic analysis where you're looking at event-specific impacts and use that as a scaling factor. And then once you do that, you've got community effects um, you can start looking at um, social equity issues uh, and so on. We've already done a little of that uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, and then prioritizing uh, infrastructure hardening projects. This is something that we're looking at with, um, with the NGOs, figuring out where there's essentially uh, exits waiting to happen or to use uh, Robert's word, uh, susceptibility, uh, where they might want to start looking at the critical infrastructure um, uh, a little more carefully. All right, over to Diana. Awesome. Thank you so much, Charlie. Um, I'm guessing the folks are switching over to my slides now. Um, but while they do that, hi, I'm Diana from Kinetic Analysis. Uh, we are a leading provider of global real-time data on tropical cyclone hazards and losses. And uh, I think you can all agree that, especially after what we heard from Charlie, uh, climate disasters are, of course, serious, and there's no such thing as being too prepared. So with the help of MHCAT, we created Kineticast, which is an applied forecasting tool. Click. Uh, next. OK. Yeah, so these are some of the folks we worked with. Uh, next. So Kineticast is a web app. Uh, next. Kinecast is a web app that provides access to enhanced and aggregated global near real-time tropical cyclone data. Uh, so it's a lot easier to understand with screenshots. Uh, next, here are, uh, from what it was like live back when I took these screenshots. So when you first go to Kineticast, you are greeted with a look at the current active storms and some basic information in table form. Next. And you can hover over any storm to identify it. Next. Uh, so when you click on each storm, you're brought to an interactive console where you can see the data in much greater detail. And so to generate these results, we take input from forecasts, so like from agencies or model guidances, and run our in-house atmospheric and oceanic models. And then the results are updated on Kineticast, usually within 30 minutes of any new forecast becoming available. Uh, next. So here are some of um, next. Here's what they look like for each of the active storms that I just showed you. Next. Um, and so some data are displayed on the maps by default, while others aren't. Earlier, I just showed you what 
is by default displayed, but you can always toggle other layers on and off. So here I've switched on the multi-model track layer to show forecasts from a variety of agencies and model guidances. Next. And then I turned on the cone of uncertainty layer, which, you know, cone of uncertainty is based on forecast to, uh, statistics for the past five years. So it's useful, but it's not specific to the storm itself. But one way you could use it is by combining it with the multi-model tracks like I do in the screenshot here. And you can sort of get a qualitative gauge on uncertainty. So if all the tracks are within the cone or maybe tracks are all over the place. Next. You can also change the hazard of interest. So we looked at maximum winds before. Here is storm surge inundation, and the legend has updated, of course. So this was generated due to our models capturing the response of the ocean to the changing atmospheric pressure. Our storm surge over land accounts for a tidal stage at time of landfall, as well as wind and wave setup. So these details are uh, much more important when you're looking at places with a large tidal range. Next. And then there's significant wave height. So we use this wave data to model the wave setup when calculating the storm surge results you just saw. Click. And then there's a cumulative rainfall, which you know, all of our hazards account for surface roughness, topography, bathymetry, coastlines, et cetera. So that's something that's not as likely to be found elsewhere. Next. And we also have some additional tools that are uh, more you're able to see in more detail uh, when you're looking at a fuller set of data of like more active or like bigger storms in general. So here is Hurricane Irma as a demo. Uh, when you have storms that are intense enough to generate losses of note, we have additional layers becoming available. So here, loss facility layers become active, and losses refer to economic loss in USD in terms of purchasing power parity and can be broken down into admin levels. So so admin zero for national, next, or admin two for county level, et cetera. All of our hazards are run at 60 arc second resolution or about two kilometers, so there's a lot of detail. Next, and with a big storm, you get facility impacts. So here it is broken down by airports, but there's also other types of impacts you can look at as well. Next. And then sometimes you can look at it in table form if that's easier for you uh, versus like a map. So we have, uh, you know, breakdowns of all of these impacts and losses in tabular form as well. Next. And for the facility impacts, we have in the table the start time of impact for each facility and its duration of shutdown. Next. And so uh, you might have noticed two other tabs, the forecast quality and forecast history. So real quick, remember this map. Next and see how things change. Basically, what we're doing here is changing the model that we're looking at um, the results from. So earlier, was, we were looking at NHC, and now it's the UKM from the UK Meteorology, Mete Meteorology uh, Office. And so you can look at these uh, different hazards uh, by the model breakdown um, using our map. Next. And then the forecast quality and forecast history basically are tabs that provide you a way of comparing how these models are performing for a particular storm. So the forecast quality slide basically shows you how close each model's forecast was to the storm's actual track. Uh, the farther away a point is from the center of the circle, the more off the forecast was for that day. And it can help one decide if a particular forecast is uh, something that should be prioritized more for that storm's analysis. Next. And the forecast history tab basically shows the same information, but all grouped together on one big graph. Next. So we're proud of what we've been able to create with ImageCat, but with Jedi, we're hoping to bring our data to the next level. With Jedi being able to retrieve our hazard data and then forecasting inter-country large-scale economic data so that folks can make more informed decisions about impacts, emergency planning, and such. Next. So thank you so much for having me, and thank you, Charlie, for inviting me to be part of this. Thank you, Charlie and Diana, for the wonderful presentation on earthquake exposure and vulnerability, as well as the Canadacast tool. We'll now hear from Eric Fielding to hear more about tornado damage and impacts. Hi, I'm Eric Fielding. I work at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, operated by the California Institute of Technology. And I'll be talking today on the next slide about how we use radar data uh, synthetic aperture radar, if you want to be more precise, uh, how to make damage proxy maps, uh, which are a map of uh, likely damage. It's not a, uh, it, it gives a, an idea of damage, but for certain types of uh, things that strongly reflect radar. And fortunately, 
buildings and other infrastructure strongly reflects radar. Uh, and that means that we can easily uh, detect the damage uh, to buildings and other infrastructure by looking at how uh, the radar reflection changes. We use a technique called um, interferometry and the interferometric coherence uh, and to see how that interferometric coherence changes and uh, detect uh, damage uh, at, at quite high resolution. And uh, we look at damage from a wide variety of, uh, of disasters, earthquakes, uh, tornadoes, hurricanes, explosions, floods, whatever. Uh, but today I'm going to be talking uh, specifically about a application to uh, tornadoes uh, because we have a short period of time. And our primary data set right now is the uh, Copernicus uh, Sentinel-1 radar satellites uh, operated by the Europeans. Uh, they cover most of the world uh, every 12 days, but we're looking forward to the uh, NASA ISRO SAR mission, the NISAR mission, that will provide uh, global coverage uh, in, in less than a, in about a year from now, uh, and when when that uh, nice our mission is launched. Next slide shows uh, I'm going to talk today specifically about uh, our measurements for this uh, December 2021 uh, Tier Two uh, Disasters Program activation. That uh, there was a large outbreak of tornadoes across. Uh, Kentucky and uh, other neighboring states, uh, including uh, one extremely long track that was 165 miles long that uh, hit was uh, EF4 over most of the length, uh, going over uh, the city of Mayfield and uh, the town of Dawson Springs. But there were many other uh, tornadoes, including one that hit uh, Bowling Green, and I'm, gonna, I'm going to show uh, shortly. So uh, the next slide shows our uh, damage proxy map for uh, the areas of Mayfield, Kentucky and Bowling Green. Uh, these are two cities that were hit by two different tornadoes They're in the same outbreak. Uh, the Mayfield one was the most tragic one because it, uh, it went right through the center of the city uh, and um, destroyed a factory that was full of people working. Uh, the, and we can see here in the red colors, uh, the, the damage, uh, like areas of likely damage. And it shows us very clearly that a large part of the city of Mayfield was uh, strongly affected by the, this uh, EF4 uh, tornado that went through uh, the, the center of the city. And then uh, on the right here, we have a, a somewhat larger area of the larger city of Bowling Green. And uh, on this one, we can see that the tornado track affected uh, a much smaller percentage of the area, but there was some uh, strong damage in, right along the uh, tornado track. Uh, so this radar data uh, allows us to uh, provide these damage maps um, when once we get the uh, post uh, event uh, radar imagery. And the next slide uh, shows uh, the damage proxy maps for the very small uh, city or town of uh, Dawson Springs in, uh, in Kentucky. Uh, but again, there was also hit by uh, the category four uh, uh, tornado, uh, the same track that also hit Mayfield. And uh, over here on the right, we uh, show these uh, red boxes uh, outline the uh, areas that we process the uh, damage proxy maps for. These damage proxy maps are then uh, posted on the uh, NASA disasters portal. It's the same uh, uh, URL that was uh, mentioned uh, several times earlier. Uh, so these data sets are then available to people as soon as we've uh, process them and, and done some very preliminary validation. And then we are now looking forward to the uh, the new NASA uh, radar mission, the NISAR mission that will be launched uh, in about a year, a uh, year and a half. So uh, that's uh, just a very brief overview of our uh, damage proxy maps with the application to tornadoes. Uh, 
and we produce these for a, a wide variety of events around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, for that insightful overview. We will now turn it over to Sean McCartney to learn more about humanitarian training with RCEP. Great, thanks so much, Caroline. Uh, I would first like to acknowledge Dr. Jamin Vandenhoek from Oregon State University, who was one of the champions of this training. I would also like to uh, recognize Dr. Anna Prados uh, for making sure this tra uh, training went to, uh, came to fruition. So earlier this summer, RSEC conducted its first ever training on humanitarian applications using NASA Earth observations to coincide around World Refugee Day on June 20th, 2022. Conflict, war, and forced displacement affect millions of people each year and have immediate and long-term consequences for human health and development, in addition to causing the degradation of natural and managed landscapes. So why do we need a training on remote sensing applications in humanitarian settings? Analysis with NASA satellite imagery can help target humanitarian response and relief by offering a timely understanding of region-specific environmental conditions and change, and capture contextual information over broad geographic re regions over time spans. Any remote sensing approach that is effective for mapping environmental conditions <clears throat> or change outside of a humanitarian setting should still be effective in a humanitarian setting. Topics in the four-part webinar series included monitoring urban damage from conflict using INSAR data. This is echoing uh, Dr. Fielding's uh, presentation that he just gave. Uh, mapping refugee settlement dynamics using optical data and gauging climate hazards at refugee settlements. For each topic, we discussed relevant satellite sensors and methodologies, data access and analysis, as well as assumptions, opportunities, and limitations of various remote sensing-based approaches in humanitarian applications. Next slide. One of the objectives of the training was to select a range of satellite imagery, could be optical, radar, or nighttime lights, for humanitarian applications, and recognize the value of time series analysis for monitoring acute and long-term changes in humanitarian contexts. Another objective was to integrate satellite-derived humanitarian data with open access geospatial products on population, building footprints, and infrastructure. According to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, or UNHCR, 73% of refugees seek asylum in neighboring countries. Developing countries host 86% of the world's refugees, and since 2010, the globally uh, forcibly displaced population has doubled. The UNHCR shelters nearly a third of global refugees and settlements and is challenged by ensuring sufficient space for shelter and agriculture, efficiently distributing aid, providing access to services within and nearby settlements, and mitigating environmental damage. Next slide. Due to the need for immediate relief, refugee settlements tend to be rapidly established and populated. Much geospatial data on dwellings, land use, and infrastructure are collected during these initial months following refugee arrival. Satellite imagery is uniquely valuable for monitoring humanitarian conditions at refugee settlements. Satellite data can be adapted to support different lines of inquiry at different stages of a settlement's lifespan. Satellite-derived information on environmental and climatic conditions in and around refugee settlements help to localize insights on refugee livelihoods, sustainable development, disaster risk reduction, and climate adaptation. Land use and land change analysis helps to capture the geographic pattern of conversion of natural vegetation to infrastructure, dwellings, and agriculture. The timing, magnitude, and spatial extent of changes assessed through time series analysis are a result of refugee arrivals to different camps. Next slide. The training also included satellite drive settlement data sets that may, be, that may help by um, may be helpful in delineating a function, functional refugee settlement boundary and, pro, and provided code in Google Earth Engine to classify and estimate the functional boundary of ref, refugee settlements by year. The training touched upon land degradation associated with refugee settlements by measuring the change in net primary productivity as one indicator of land degradation compared to a baseline. The final part of the webinar series focused on how satellite data can guide estimates of climate and environmental exposure in support of humanitarian monitoring. The session applied a multi-criteria hazard analysis using Google Colab and Jupyter Notebooks to estimate climate hazard potential across multiple sites to evaluate how different satellite products influence climate hazard assessment, as well as compare climate hazard profiles to known hazard events. Typical climate hazards impacting refugee camps include landslides, flooding, droughts, and heat waves. Last slide. Ultimately, gauging climate disaster risk in refugee settings means understanding how exposure, social, social vulnerability, and weather and climate uh, events interact. Action can be taken if risk is understood and if there are standard operating procedures to act if a shift of that risk is identified in forecasts. Next slide. 
And thank you for listening. And Caroline, back to you. Thank you, Sean, for that wonderful overview of humanitarian trainings at RSET. For our last talk, a part of the Disasters Applications Overview and Highlights, I am happy to introduce Garrett Lane to learn more about open science and also learn hear more about the Disasters Portal. So hi, I'm Garrett Lane. I'm the GIS lead for the uh, Earth Science Applied Earth Applied Sciences Disasters Program. Um, so today, I'm, today I'm going to give a little bit of an overview of our uh, Disasters Mapping Portal, which has been referenced quite a few times in the previous uh, previous presentations. Uh, next slide. Uh, so what is the disaster bank portal? Uh, the portal is the hub of the geos of geospatially enabled NASA disaster products. Uh, it's intended to be a one-stop shop that stakeholders can access to find NASA data before, during, and after a disaster occurs. It's intended to be not only focused on disaster response, but also elements on elements of disaster risk and resilience. Uh, the portal hosts multiple types of products, um, event-based, which are created in response to an event, as well as near-real-time data products that are routinely um, created and hosted at other NASA groups, such as Lance or a, a, date, a DAC. Um, the portal is a proving ground to make NASA Earth science data accessible and discoverable to both non-science users and experienced practitioners. All data hosted on the portal is free and openly available. Um, there's no login requirements to, to basically help promote open science and innovation. All data hosting portal is also ready to be used and does not require any additional processing or require the user to download data. Although if they would like to download data, there is that option and it is available for most of our products. Um, the portal is also an interoperable platform with a uniform format, allowing for easy ingestion by disaster managers, humanitarian relief organizations, and other stakeholders, as well as the public. Uh, data is hosted in both REST and WMS endpoints, so that allows for easy ingestion by users who are both using, using both commercial uh, GIS software such as Esri or open source GIS software such as QGIS. Um, the portal is also a collaboration environment where story maps and applications are used to demonstrate how products can be synthesized and used for um, decision support. Uh, next slide. Uh, so data on the portal needs to be accessible. Uh, from our meetings and demonstrations with stakeholders, one thing we commonly hear is that if the data can't be quickly interpreted, then it's not going to be used. So in order to make our data accessible, the data needs to be described in a plain English, described in plain English without any complex naming conventions where a user would need to look into a guide to understand what they're looking at. Um, so I have an example up on the screen uh, and as well as some of the categories that we generally showcase uh, for our descriptions. Um, so because of that, we break these up into small sections without you know, paragraphs of text so that a user can quickly learn what the product is, find out how we recommend that it can be, it be used as well as find links to stream the service or download data if they are interested and have the remote sensing expertise to download and look at the data themselves. Um, the product description has also evolved quite a bit over the last few years, and a lot of that has been due to direct feedback from stakeholders about what they'd like to see, what they don't like, how it can be improved. Um, next slide. Uh, and to, so to help users better understand the products we provide and how they can be used, we create interactive web apps, web applications, dashboards, store, and story maps. So these applications can help introduce less familiar satellite data um, and explain more complex products to stakeholders who maybe aren't familiar or are used to working with remote sense, remotely sensed data. Uh, they can also show ways to use NASA data for, for a disaster. And they can also um, demonstrate ways that NASA data can be combined with other sources and promote collabor the collaborative nature of GIS services. Um, in an ideal world, we want users to be able to take our data and pull it into their own system so that they can combine it with their own internal data sets and use NASA data to help fill gaps. Um, so I have two examples of these two examples of these types of applications shown on the slide. Um, the top slide is showing um, an interactive web app that from, that explains the benefit of using synthetic aperture radar for detecting flooding, flooding during uh, Hurricane Dorian. Um, so from interacting with a lot of stakeholders, we've, we've seen that uh, some of our SAR-based products garner a lot of attention uh, and interest, but at the same time, they're off, they're, can be more difficult to understand by less experienced users. So applications like this that can show the benefit of um, SAR and how it, can be used, how it can be useful and how it differs from more traditional optical sensors uh, is really useful in making the data more accessible to the non-science user. And then the bottom image also um, shows a tropical cyclone dashboard. So this combines NASA and Euro time data with data from other agencies into one application. So you can see how NASA data can work with NOAA data with USGS data to look at um, potential risk from hurricanes and just to monitor situations as they're occurring. And so again, it gives an example of how 
a user could possibly bring our data into their own system and combine it with their own data. Um, so that way they don't have to go to our portal and always come back to, to use our data. Um, next slide. And so to make data that's hosted on the portal more discoverable and accessible, all data and most of our applications are also shared to ArcGIS Online through NASA's ArcGIS Online, uh, which the link is also there. Uh, so many GIS users and organizations work heavily in ArcGIS Online. Uh, so by sharing our data there, they can access and ingest it without having to visit our portal directly. Um, many GIS, um, so by making this data available there, uh, it is now discoverable by a user who is searching for data from their own ArcGIS Online account. That's what the image on the bottom is showing is just their own, have their own web map up and they can search NASA, Hurricane Ida, and our data services are immediately pop up, whether they've ever been to our portal or not. Um, so it's really trying to increase, really helps to increase the discoverability and accessibility of our data. Um, ArcGIS Online also makes data discoverable through open data search, uh, open data search engines. So just increasing, the, again, the discoverability of our data. And then over the last few years, we've made a lot of progress to make our data products more accessible um, through our portal. And so we're always continuously exploring new ways to create more a more collaborative GIS environment and also to help meet uh, NASA's open data goals. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, Garrett, for the amazing overview of the disasters portal. Next, we'll transition to the Get Involved Prizes and Challenges applications guidebook and open science session, as well as later end with some closing remarks. A huge thank you to all of our speakers for the disasters applications overview and highlight session. Awesome, thank you so much, Caroline. And hi, everybody. Um, welcome to the final session of the 2022 NASA Earth Science Applications Week. My name is Katie Lang, and I'm a fellow with the NASA Develop National Program at the National Centers for Environmental Information and I will be your MC for our final event this week. Over the last three days, we've learned so much from researchers and end users on the many ways that NASA Earth Science helps make our world a better place. And in this final session, we are gonna be focusing on how you can get involved. Our upcoming speakers will introduce us to some amazing initiatives and resources of ways to stay connected with the applied sciences community, including prizes and challenges, an applications guidebook, and also discussing NASA's transformation to open science. Once again, just given the number of attendees, speakers, and events that we have going on this week, we would like to thank you in advance for your patience with any te technical difficulties that we might encounter. And just a few quick reminders before we begin today's Get Involved session. Uh, please make sure that you're muted with your video turned off while our presenters are speaking, just to avoid bandwidth or feedback issues. And we encourage you to use the chat function to post any comments or questions that you might have for our speakers. And now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speakers for this session, two open innovation interns at NASA headquarters, Emily Gilbert and Diana Garcia Silva, to talk to us about NASA's open innovation, prizes, and challenges. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you loud and clear. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. So my name is Diana Garcia Silva. And first off and real quick, um, have any of you heard of Prize and Challenges? Say yes or no in the chat or give like a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Awesome, that's great. So for those of you who are not familiar with Prize and Challenges, NASA has a long history of uh, open innovation by inviting the public to participate in incentivized incentivize uh, competitions called prizes and challenges. And challenges are defined questions uh, formulated by a government agency in order to answer ongoing and big scientific questions. And they are often in collaboration with other federal agencies or private organizations. And we share these challenges with the public and, in, and teams and individuals in order to invite their ideas, their technologies, and anything they can provide to help answer these big questions. And the winning teams from these challenges are awarded cash prizes, cash, cash prizes and incentives as recognitions for the contributions. And these challenges um, allow us to reach people around the world with diverse backgrounds and skills and experience and to invite and in, um, their perspectives and many disciplines to help address our toughest problems that we, that we alone cannot answer. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, before you are a couple of past uh, past present challenges projects and 
some of us are kind of familiar with that for NASA, we're familiar with space exploration projects along those lines, but NASA is involved in a lot of different other projects um, that are not uh, towards space alone. So we see um, on the far left is a vascular tissue challenge, which is a physiological health and medicine challenge. And then we see a waste base, which is a waste stream challenge that um, finding how can we use waste to make materials in space and 3D printed habitat challenge with the construction and technology challenge. And then one of my favorites is where, where's whale do challenge. So it's a biological challenge where we're asking the public, hey, send us your pictures. Let's compare them to a known database and find out the populations of one of the most endangered beluga whale populations. What can they tell, about, tell us about that? Next slide, please. So for this slide, you'll be um, hearing from Emily who's gonna be talking about her her prizes and project challenges before we continue on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diana. So my name is Emily Gelbart and I'll be talking about addressing harmful algal bloom issues and the prize competition that we're currently doing for that. So does anyone know what a harmful algal bloom is? You can give me a thumbs up, give me a thumbs down if you don't. And if you do, do you have a story of a harmful algal bloom? Throw that in the chat if you do, because there's some pretty interesting stories out there. Uh, think of Florida, the Gulf Coast of Mexico. That's where you can hear a lot of big stories on harmful algal blooms. Well, harmful algal blooms. I'll tell you a quick definition of them just to get us started. They're defined by a rapid growth in algal colonies that may have a negative impact on both human and aquatic health. This is because they may be able to release toxins in the water. So we can actually identify cyanobacteria that may be related to a harmful algal bloom through in-situ monitoring. But that's really hard to do. We have a very large world and a lot of water bodies to try and look into. So we're trying to see if we can use remote sensing to provide a solution to identify cyanobacteria, not only in oceans and large water bodies, but more smaller and more inland water bodies. So how do you bridge that gap? Well, prizes and challenges. We're seeing if we can create a combined data set to give to data scientists, not harmful algal bloom scientists, but to data scientists to say, hey, can you help us develop an algorithm that's not only going to detect patterns of cyanobacteria blooms, but we'll be able to use a higher spatial and temporal resolution to do so. Just a new and innovative way to try and do this. And if you check out this chat, there's some pretty cool stories going on about people who've interacted with a harmful algal bloom. So thank you so much for posting those. On uh, next slide, please. So for this competition, we're actually working backwards, which is pretty fun. So for in-situ measurements, we need some data on cyanobacteria. So what we've done and what my emails can show you, I have many emails on this. I've been in contact with over 150 water quality managers collecting cyanobacteria cell density data from a time frame of 2013 to 2021. And we're focusing on a specific uh, group of sampling parameters for date, time, cell density, and latitude and longitude of our sampling sites. Now this is going to help us correlate that data set that we're creating with some remote sensing imagery, specifically using Landsat and Sentinel-2 products. Now this gives us a unique data set for participants that will give them the answers. We're actually giving it to them and we're saying, you work backwards and you use machine learning methods to create an algorithm for us. And that's what we're going to use to classify this competition. Who's got the best algorithm? Are they able to detect patterns of these harmful algal blooms accurately? And what are the unique ways that they do it? Are they doing it by looking at specific time frames or specific seasons that they're classifying these algorithms by? So we're really leaving it up to them to say, you figure out how to do this. Next slide, please. Now, we just wanted to acknowledge out of the 150 people that we've contacted, we do have 18 different organizations that have provided us some of that data. So thank you to those people who have. If you have data on cyanobacteria, you should email me. But we just wanted to say thank you to them and acknowledge them and showing you that we are making progress on this project and we will be hosting it hopefully very, very soon. But it's just a wonderful way to incorporate data science and environmental science together, just a new and innovative way to address an issue that affects everybody on this world. 
So thank you so much, and I'm going to hand it off to Diana so she can talk about her prize competition or how she's analyzing prize competitions, actually. Thank you, Emily. So just like Emily, um, NASA has run a lot of competitions that are really fun and innovative. And my project within the Prize and Challenges program is doing a retrospective analysis of NASA's history in crowdsourcing and crowdsourcing of projects and challenges to support earth science and environmental causes, um, such as the prize and challenges I had shown you earlier. Um, thank you for coming to the next slide. Um, so the objective for this um, is specifically aimed towards analyzing impacts from prizes and challenges, because we are trying to uh, be comprehensive in the analysis of the impacts that comes from these challenges. Uh, for we are, do not want to look at just the solutions that are being developed, but what are the other types of impacts that we can potentially measure from these projects to help us move forward in analyzing all future present challenges competitions. Um, because from these challenges, we can see that they're also different. They're all have their own complex aspects to them. and in terms of the project type that they are, the materials and the uh, and the different companies or agencies that participate within them. And from that, we the goals are uh, to review what these past projects are, uh, what are the common type of impacts that we see from them, and to develop a metric to do future as, um, impact assessments for all future prize and challenge competitions. And this is important because we want to see not just the impact impacts from them, but what are the values do they provide for us and how do we measure those values in the future? Next slide, please. Thank you. So a big part of this project is doing impact assessments. And impact assessments is, um, if you're not familiar with them, is a type of structured decision process that describes what are the impacts from these um, from these projects and what are the potential benefits or are there any uh, negative negatives from these projects that need to be uh, reduced or mitigated um, in, their, in order to enhance their positive outcomes. And impact assessments range from a lot of different types of impacts from environmental, academic, cultural, technology, and so forth. But the two most common ones are environmental impact assessments and um, economic impact assessments. And because there are so many different types of impact assessment, we are researching the different types of them and which ones we can um, you uh, look for in our project assessments and the value that they go towards the scope of our project, um, especially towards like community, environment, and so forth, and help us analyze which impacts uh, going forth can be further evaluated in comparison to the mostly common impacts that are done today. Next slide, please. So before you, you see a plane here, um, and this is uh, one of the past uh, prize and challenge competitions known as the Green Flight Challenge. And this challenge had what main goal was to build a fuel efficient aircraft that can fly about 200 miles in less than two hours using one gallon of gasoline. So it was a sustainable type type of project, which in, which is the main, the main impact from it was technology. So this is one of the projects we'll be looking at, looking at the type of impact, specifically technology, and what other um, impacts that are from here and how can now, um, how can, what type of analysis can we use to find out um, going forward, how can we analyze its impacts and other aspects? Next slide, please. So here's one of the another um, prize and challenge competition that was very popular called the XView2 challenge. And it was a machine learning algorithm challenge that could process uh, pre and post natural di uh, disaster satellite imagery in order to ha help assess um, uh, building damages and the extent of natural disasters like wildfires. And that's very important because going forth, we've seen like a lot of natural disasters coming forth and we need to know how can we better um, prepare for them in the future. And when you look at the its overall, as, uh, its overall um, impact, you can see that environment is a big one. Next slide, please. So from these impact assessments, we also want to study like what are the common mythologies from these impact assessments that we could utilize for our own project um, in order to inform how, um, what kind of, um, inform us what kind of quantitative, qualitative or empirical measurements that we can use 
to set the value of each of these projects we want to look at in order to see like what the values are from these projects and how we use them for others. And from that, one of them, another project that is going on uh, right now that we would like you to get involved in and that's open to the public is the call to action that's our science in action comic strip contest so that's open to everyone from high schoolers to age participants and this is helpful to us because you are all great scientists and educators and students alike want to know how they can get involved, how they can contribute to NASA innovation. And this one way you can do it is by going to prize and challenges, giving, uh, providing your ideas, any solutions, and how to make information more accessible, uh, giving us your ideas and just making the world a better place. And that is all for today. Thank you. Oh, next slide. Oh, sorry, one more slide. In order to say thank you, these are our next steps. Uh, Emily, if you want to go forth for the next steps, that'd be great. Of course, we're just looking to get our remote sensing imagery so that we can connect it to the in situ measurements that we have. And then we are really hoping to publish this data set. The whole point of this is to make sure that we help water quality managers mitigate problems and issues that are caused by harmful algal blooms. So again, tell your data science friends that this competition will be coming out and just keep on for those next steps. We have some links on there as well and I believe they've been put in the chat. And great job, Diana. Thank you. Also, I forgot to say this real quick, the next steps for my project is looking at, um, is contacting many people and interviewing them, such as participants from these past prior challenges and project managers and get their inputs on what were their insights from these projects and how could what are how can they be moved forward towards the community and so forth and then analyze those impacts from pride and challenges through several risk um, retrospective methods so that is qualitative quantitative or anything that's out there that can help us analyze what their value is what their impacts are and how can we further understand each project moving forward and how can we make them better for the general public thank you Thank you so much, Emily and Diana, for that wonderful presentation. What an amazing way to get people within and outside the agency involved in scientific and technical explorations. Now, please welcome Dr. Aaron Urquhart, the PACE Project Applications Coordinator at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center to discuss NASA's Early Adopters Program. Thanks, Katie. Um, so yeah, uh, so throughout the week, you know, you guys have all heard about a lot of different ways to get involved with NASA Applied Sciences. We've heard, you know, from develop, um, RSET, severe. Uh, we've looked at different program elements, um, and a lot of these um, activities happen after a satellite is launched. So I want to take a minute and talk a little bit about some pre-launch mission activities that you all can get involved in. Um, so you've heard the term early adopter a couple times this week, um, specifically in some of those pre-launch missions. So we had a presentation yesterday by the Pace mission and a presentation on Tuesday by the Tempo mission. Um, so what is an early adopter program? So NASA early adopter programs promote applied science and applications research designed to scale and integrate NASA data into policy, business, management activities that can benefit society and inform decision making. So the goals of the early adopter program are to provide opportunities to partner with mission scientists, uh, to provide the mission with feedback on the utility of data, and that can look a lot of different ways depending on what phase the mission is in its pre-launch cycle. Um, to support early adopters and to build capacity to accelerate NASA data uptake after these missions are on orbit, um, to really expand the mission visibility um, and to build partnerships with new users and new communities. And then lastly, to enhance the mission data products and services based on user feedback from individuals like you. Next slide. So I wanted to give just a couple examples um, of some early adopter programs, and then I'll talk about, you know, how do you get involved and what's the eligibility. So I have five different uh, early adopter project applications up here on the screen, and I'm just going to give you a little bit of a snapshot of a few of these. So the first one uh, is fishing and recreation. So FICOP is an organization in Costa Rica which is partnered with the PACE mission to support a mobile application tool. Um, this tool is called PESCA. And PESCA enables monitoring of ocean conditions while promoting sustainable fishing practices. So future PACE data will improve model output for red tide component of the mobile application, which will result in more effective harmful algal bloom response, greater preparedness for ecotourism, sport, and commercial fishing industries in Central America. 
Um, the next project I'm showing uh, is uh, by the Center for Space and Remote Sensing Research in Taiwan. Um, so this center has partnered with the Taiwan Ministry of Interior and the ISAT-2 mission. Um, so together, they're going to produce satellite-derived bathymetry and underwater terrain navigation maps uh, in shallow island waters. So the data in the maps are being used to identify nearshore ship navigation, um, sea sand dredging, sunken ships, and status of change of underwater terrain. Um, next up, we have the Bureau of Street Services in the city of Los Angeles, California, uh, who has partnered with the EcoStress mission on the development of a project that quantifies the direct cooling effect of cool painted streets within neighborhoods across Los Angeles. Um, so EcoStress data is combined with demographic data to quantify societal heat vulnerability that people experience in different regions of the city. Um, and then we have an air quality project. Uh, so the Colorado Department of Public Health Air Pollution Control Division has partnered with air quality modelers as well as the TEMPO mission to support high spatiotemporal air quality observations and in turn improve air quality forecasts around the region. All right, next slide. So before I tell you how to become an early adopter, I'm going to tell you why you should become an early adopter. Um, so there's a there's a lot of different benefits of becoming an early adopter, but I wanted to kind of distill it down to just a handful. Um, so as across all um, pre launch NASA, NASA Earth missions, um, one of our biggest goals is to build partnerships between data users and data producers. So one of the main benefits of joining an early adopter program is networking and building partnerships with NASA scientists. Um, the second benefit is participation in that that pre launch missions, all of their application activities. Um, and I have a slide later in the deck that will kind of talk about these types of activities that pre launch missions host. Um, another benefit is collaboration with other early adopters. So every mission has kind of a different number of early adopter teams. You know, this can be larger, you know, programs, it can be more intimate groups. Um, but the benefit here is that you kind of have direct access to not only mission scientists, but the wealth of teams um, that are also early adopters for this pre launch mission. Um, back to partnerships, another partnership uh, opportunity here is that you get a partner with the, the funded science team members, as well as the science data systems and the data archive systems for that pre launch mission. Um, this is kind of the, the opportunity for you know, applied scientists like yourselves to provide feedback on data delivery, data tools, data services, data formats, map projections, GIDA projections, all before this, this satellite is on orbit. Um, and then lastly, you know, the thing that most people are interested in is by joining an early adopter team, you learn about access to simulated and proxy data sets before the mission is on orbit. So you can start integrating this pre-launch data into your systems and your applications to work out all of the kinks, um, you know, to see how you can break it, to be better prepared so after this mission is on orbit, you can just hit go and your application can start serving data um, and applications. So next slide. So every Earth science mission that has an application program and an early adopter program looks a little bit different, but in general, um, kind of across all these missions, um, in order to become an early adopter, um, we kind of have four main, you know, musts of who you should look like to apply. Um, so I think the big one is you have an existing application um, or you have an innovative idea of how NASA data can be used to really support decision making activities and have a direct impact on society. Um, applicants should work in close coordination with their end user community or on behalf of their user community. So what that means is that you, you know, you should really understand the decision making framework and context and understand how your eventual end users are going to use the output of your data that's coming from NASA. Um, you know, obviously you need to have a willingness to learn about the mission data, um, the developmental products, and lastly, to provide testimonials and kind of continuous feedback on that pre launch mission data. Um, and to, you know, to provide testimonials and progress updates on how this data is going to improve decision making processes, not just for you, but for your user communities. Next slide. So I want to talk a little bit more about some of these benefits. So one of the really big benefits is that you have direct access um, and kind of a direct line of communication to not only mission scientists, but a lot of the funded scientists uh, that are part of that mission. So this is just an example from the PACE mission, um, and it's kind of a cartoon showing, you know, early adopters plus a PACE science team member 
equals this beneficial application for communities. Um, and so I, I've kind of put together, you know, your early adopter and who their paired partner is. Um, and, you know, we have applications complete, including monitoring of fisheries in Central America, um, sustainable aquaculture and site selection, uh, detecting and differentiating oil spills and slicks in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so this is just kind of an opportunity to have a, a relationship with one of the, the actual data producers and scientists of that pre-launch mission. Next slide. So another really big benefit of becoming an early adopter um, is that people like me um, across all these pre-launch missions, we really advocate for your, your applied activities. Um, at every chance I get, I, you know, I make sure that I highlight my early adopter team's work through web presence, uh, through project promotion, um, to invitation to pre-launch and launch events. Um, and advocacy at both external academic conferences and industry conferences. Um, so after you become an early adopter, the, the mission application team will work very closely with you to develop these types of promotional and marketing materials for your applied research. Um, and I'm just showing a couple pictures here of, you know, like I said, you may have web presence on the early adopters website. Um, you may be invited to different um, in-person or virtual now um, types of activities to promote your applied work. Next slide. Um, and by joining the early adopter program, you'll have the opportunity to participate in various mission activities. Um, so this can be everything from, you know, routine uh, teleconferences that that mission may, may host. Um, pretty much every uh, application early adopter uh, pre-launch mission um, hosts annual workshops. So you'll be invited to participate in that. Um, you know, most missions have deeper dive focus sessions where, you know, you really have that intimate feedback on how something in a topic area that you're working on may contribute and influence that pre-launch mission. Um, most missions host tutorials, whether that be individually or with NASA RCEP programs, um, but you will be asked to participate in those types of events and even maybe showcase your activities as part of that training. Um, and then lastly, um, most pre-launch missions also participate in large town halls at, um, you know, big society types of events. And so you'll be invited to those and your, your research can be showcased there. So next slide. So there's a, there's been about 11 different, um, earth science missions that have had early adopter programs. Um, and we, we have a page on the, the applied sciences website. We can find out more about all of these different missions. Um, I've just listed out you know, a couple handfuls of the missions that are currently recruiting early adopters. So um, if you didn't know about these early adopter programs and you want to find more, like I said, every mission is a little bit different. Everybody kind of recruits a little bit differently, but we all do have that common goal um, of, you know, really supporting folks like yourselves in your pre-launch activities so that once these missions are on orbit, you can just hit the ground running um, with without as many issues as maybe if you weren't familiar and you didn't have those relationships before the mission was on orbit. So um, I have dropped a link in the chat that goes to the same place as the scan me does, um, but don't hesitate to reach out um, and we're excited for you to get involved. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Urquhart, for that wonderful overview on the early adopters program. Um, next up, I'm happy to introduce Aaron Martin. NASA's Applications Guidebook Lead, who will share some information on a resource that we in NASA Applied Sciences are extremely excited about, the NASA Applications Guidebook. So take it away, Erin. Thank you, Katie. Um, hello, everyone. It's wonderful to be with this global audience today and um, really excited to share a little bit about the Earth Science Applications Guidebook. If you're like me, uh, after attending the last couple of days of, uh, of Earth Science Applications Week, you've made a list of things that you wanna learn more about and dig deeper into. And um, this guidebook may be an opportunity for you to do that actually. So just moving on to the next slide, I would love to tell you a little bit more about the guidebook. Um, you can see there's a QR code there if you wanna dive right in and we'll be putting the links into the chat. Uh, we can move on to the next slide. The um, guidebook is um, a summary of the or a synthesis of the best practices in developing earth science applications. If you want to move forward, you can go ahead. That would be great. Um, it builds on decades of experience within NASA and other places to provide practical tips and guidance how to build and using earth science information, particularly to build applications. And the idea is 
not just thinking about a really sound scientific product, but thinking about a sound scientific product that actually is going to help with users with making decisions, uh, managing the, the issues and challenges that they face. And so this guidebook is really meant to bring all of that experience and learning together in one place for, for people to dive into. Um, we've tried very hard to make this different than your, than your average guidebook. It is primarily an online tool. It has multiple entry pathways. So you, you can see in the image that's here, those four pictures that are there, each one of those takes you into a specific area of the guidebook. So you can navigate through there. There, there is a different media in, in the guidebook. We have audio, some audio clips, and um, we really have tried to emphasize making this information accessible to all kinds of, of viewers and users, regardless of their scientific background. So you don't have to be a remote scientist to be able to dive into this and learn from it and enjoy it, hopefully. Um, we also recognize that not everybody can be online all the time. And so there are links to downloadable content so that you can actually download the entire gu guidebook and take that with you and look at it offline. So there's a couple of features there, but I just wanted to quickly take you through. So you have a little bit of orientation to what's in here. Um, that that very top box that says applying earth science, what it takes is really looking at um, what makes applied science different? You know, what is the applied and applied science and, and what is it about? And what does it take to succeed at, at building these kinds of applications and using earth observation information in a way that's gonna deliver an impact to, to its end users? So this section goes through a lot of, of that kind of information and it's it's really people-centered. The, the, the information we're sharing and the, use, the, the vignettes and use cases we have are from the perspective of the scientists who've lived this and who've really put their heart and soul and brain into this work. And so we we think that it, that creates a really, not only great information and great learning, but it also makes the information really accessible. So that's in that first quadrant, that earth science, what it takes. Then moving on to the next slide, um, the, the, the second quadrant that's in the, in the top right is using earth science to tackle critical challenges. And this is giving perspective on exactly how earth observation information is used and who are the people who are using that information. And this is a great place for, if you're working with a policymaker who might be new to uh, earth science applications or a decision maker or um, other colleagues who, who perhaps have been doing basic research and maybe don't have so much of a, a depth of knowledge about the many, many ways that earth science information is being used. This section is a good place to, um, to take them and to share that information. You'll see in this image that's here on the left where it says click to explore, it's, uh, you, this is an example of one of the interactive features that we have here where you can click on any one of those users. One of that are, these are examples of the, the many different types of groups and people who are using these applications and you can click on that and then it brings up a, a little story with about what, who they are and how they're using the information and what decision they're making to use that information. There, there are a lot of links there. So that's a, that's a really helpful uh, part of the guidebook for people maybe who are trying to get the bigger picture on, on what all this science is about. So moving on to the next slide, um, the bottom left corner in that, that first slide I, I showed you is called developing sustainable applications. And this is kind of nuts and bolts for anybody who is developing applications or considering developing applications and is the really in some ways the, the meat and potatoes of this guidebook. It, um, it has information about the process and talks a lot about user engagement and developing proposals and program management. And it's a great place to go and get really practical information. And again, we've got, you can see these question marks. It says, click on the question marks. There's a lot of interactive content there. And there's also downloadable content. For example, the proposal checklist and the pro tips are down, you can easily click when you get to that page and download the information that's there. So, um, so th th there's something for you to take away if you're not able to be online the whole time. Just moving on to the, to the next slide, this is the, the, what would be the fourth quadrant and you can see the navigation on the right hand side of the screen there. And uh, these are the, our audio use cases. Uh, if you were online earlier, you heard, heard Kyle Hilburn talk about his 
his uh, fire application. And we actually have a, an audio case style narrated by Kyle, where he talks about the development of this and shares a lot of the ups and downs and what it what it took, some of the lessons learned that that he and other his other uh, science partners had working with users and bringing the application to fruition. So we've got seven really great case studies there covering all of the applied sciences application areas and um, we'll be refreshing those regularly. So there'll be new content coming along there, but that might be a place to, to, to tune in when you have time. I just wanna call attention, if you see the very below the pink arrow, the very bottom of that navigation, you'll see something there called additional resources. And um, that's we've, we've got a lot of additional information there that will, if you're looking for access for to access for data, if you're interested in learning more about resources and um, program proposals and things, there there's also a link to the RCIT training platforms, and so, so you can find more information about training. But um, the, the, there are lots of different ways in this guidebook that you can you can find more information and dig a little bit deeper on Earth Science applications. Great, let's go to the next slide. Just want to let you know that um, this guidebook is not just a guidebook. It's actually we 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 see it as a as a launch pad for building a community around best practices and earth science applications. So we will be working with our set in the in the coming several months to develop a self paced online course related to particularly related to the developing sustainable applications part where we, that where that that nuts and bolts se section I was mentioning where we we talk about the application steps and some of the tips and practical guidance we're going to we're going to look at developing a course that will be available online and self-paced so that'll be a, another way to reinforce the learning I mentioned we're going to be looking at new content and we're going to do a couple of re phases of refreshing the content over the next several months and then we're also have we have our eyes potentially on doing a symposium on best practices and applications. Certainly you hear a lot of, you've heard a lot of best practices over the last couple of days and a lot of really insightful points of view from, from, from investigators and scientists, but we also think it would be great to bring the community together to really dive, dive more deeply into some of the lessons learned. So those are the things we're thinking about in the, um, in the, over the next uh, year to two years in terms of the guidebook, but just moving on to the last slide, I wanted to um, take a moment to ask you to please not only go visit the guidebook, but share it with your community, with your networks, because we we think there's so much there to learn, and uh, it's as I mentioned, easily accessible to people regardless of their scientific backgrounds, and um, really showcases the power and the opportunity that exists with Earth observation information. So. Hopefully you can take a take a look to at that guidebook and then pass it on. I believe you'll see some links in the chat, not only to the guidebook, but also to some additional content on the uh, uh, applied sciences website, including a video that's easily a short video about the guidebook that's easily forwardable to friends and family and colleagues. So, um, I, I'm very happy to be with you again, and um, I think I can just say thank you very much and um, turn turn things back over to Katie. Awesome. Thank you so much for that wonderful overview, Erin. Um, yeah, the guidebook is such a great resource for both brand new and seasoned professionals in the applied sciences field, and I can't wait to reference it in the future. Um, now, please welcome Cindy Hall, the Community Coordinator for NASA's Transform to Open Science, or TOPS, program to the virtual stage to discuss NASA's Transform to Open Science program. Great. Thank you, Katie. Thanks for having me. Um, we can go to the next slide. So I wanted to start off with kind of why I'm here. Um, I believe community and a diverse community is key to this effort. And I just finished a book, All We Can Save, Truth, Courage, and Solutions for the Climate Crisis. I, and every chapter in that book really resonated with me. In a chapter called Reciprocity by Janine Benias, she talks about cooperative community theory and ecology, how plants enhance their neighbors' growth, survival, and reproduction. She relates this to us as um, humans. We often see communities of plants as competitors, and we see ourselves that way as well. But by recognizing the ubiquity of sharing, acknowledging the fact that communal traits are natural, we can kind of see ourselves in a new light. And to me, this idea of community and sharing, which leads to a thriving ecosystem, is the same for us. 
By working as a community, sharing information and knowledge, science can indeed thrive. Another chapter, Indigenous Prophecy and Mother Earth by Sherry Mitchell Wena Quasset from the Penobscot Nation states, the overall lack of diversity within the patriarchal colonial paradigm has had a suffocating impact on creative intelligence and a divisive impact on society. Diversity fosters social coherence, creating more stable and harmonious relational networks. Additionally, the more diverse a group or community, the greater the perspectives and innovations that arise and the greater success rate for all. And to me, both of these statements are so foundational to open science. Sharing knowledge and code and having diverse voices at the table will only accelerate science impact and results for societal benefit. Open knowledge and diverse voices lead to better data, which leads to better science, which leads to bigger impacts. Next slide. NASA is pursuing an open source science ethos. Open source science embraces the principles of open science and activates it in a way that unlocks the full potential of a more equitable, impactful, efficient scientific future. To help catalyze and support cultural change within the scientific community, NASA has launched the Open Source Science Initiative, or OSSI, a long-term commitment to open science. And to spark change and inspire open science engagement, OSSI has created the Transform to Open Science, or TOPS program, and declared 2023 as the year of open science. Next slide. And so what is open science? Well, this means different things to different communities. NASA defines open science as a collaborative culture enabled by technology that empowers the open sharing of data, information, and knowledge within the scientific community and the wider public to accelerate scientific research and understanding. Open science creates research that is cited more, creates a bigger impact, increases transparency, and generates more collaborations. It is accessible through open and fair data and software, open access to publications and information. It is reproducible through open collaboration analysis tools and open frameworks. It is inclusive through expanding partnerships and participation, supporting diversity, equity, and belonging, and providing new pathways into science. This is going to lead to, again, more collaboration, access to hidden knowledge, and more equitable systems. Next slide. And so taking that another step forward, NASA has coined the term open source science, and this builds on concepts from open source so software, expanding participation and developing code, applying this to the scientific process to accelerate discovery by openly conducting science from project initiation through implementation. The open source science initiative is designed to make open science possible by updating NASA policies, to really state that all science mission directorate funded data, software, and results are developed collaboratively and made publicly available, broadening the community's involvement in the scientific process, increasing accessibility of data, software, and results, and thereby facilitating inclusion, transparency, and reproducibility of science. Next slide. So why is NASA advocating for open source science now? Well, there are current challenges facing the world. We just got through with the COVID-19 pandemic. Monkeypox is on the rise. We have climate change affecting the globe. We have extreme space weather events, and we need an understanding if there's life beyond Earth and so many more. Open science is transformative and that it reduces inequalities while advancing and, and really increasing trust in science. Next slide. So Transform to Open Science, or TOBS, is a $40 million five-year initiative with the objectives of increasing understanding and adoption of open science, accelerating scientific discovery for societal benefit, and broadening participation by historically underrepresented communities. We have a very ambitious task over the next five years. Um, as I mentioned, we're declaring 2023 as the year of open science. And through this five years, we're gonna work to train 20,000 or more scientists in open science practices have five major cross-disciplinary scientific discoveries using open science methods and practices, and increase participation in science of underrepresented groups, hopefully doubling the current state. Next slide, please. So 2023, the year of open science, we have four main focus areas and tops to uplift open science across the scientific community and beyond. The first is visibility and engagement, then capacity sharing and community resources, incentives, 
and then values. And these areas are designed to increase awareness about and recognition of open science, provide learning resources and events to support transitioning to open science, developing open science awards and incentives, sharing hidden knowledge, and developing more inclusive collaborations. And so this engagement is critical to change culture. TOPS during this 2023 will work to get organizations, institutions, and other partners, partners to really focus efforts and kickstart change. We're working to publish in science and organizational publications across the science spectrum so that everyone sees and hears about the benefits of open science. And we're currently working to highlight open science success stories because this is what's going to motivate us to all do the work to change science. Also, TOPS currently holds monthly community forums, the next of which is September 8th at 1 p.m. And these are listening sessions where we get community feedback from folks like yourselves. So we'll help you join us. Next slide. Another area of TOPS activity is the capacity sharing of learning resources and activities. I mentioned that we have an objective of training 20,000 or more scientists, and our hope is that 75% of principal investigators of NASA-funded proposals move to open science practices. And with the help of the American Geophysical Union, or AGU, TOPS is developing an open core curriculum. And this curriculum includes five modules, the ethos of open science, open tools and resources, open software, open data, and open results. And each module will have a badge. And then at the end, upon completion, uh, you'll get a TOPS Open Science badge and certification. Next slide. To amplify the year of open science, we're also expecting to have a variety of funding calls from OSSI TOPS. And one of those are, will focus on training. And this can include a number of different options. TOPS Champions Program, this is for scientists with representation across the Science Mission Directorate who will be funded to help teach the open core curriculum modules at different events and act as open source science champions within their community. Another option are cohorts, and in reference to the online curriculum, cohorts will engage with open core learners through a, a virtual model. And the hope is that this will increase completion rates. The cohort will be able to answer questions and provide assistance and support to others attending the online course. Summer schools, institutions will be selected to run eight to 12 weeks of meetings, providing organization, including meeting facilitation, teaching of the five modules to NASA selected science teams, and an open competitive student and early career researchers. Curriculum expansion, in addition to the five modules, we want to fund groups to create discipline specific modules, like one for Earth, data science skills, or even an environmental justice focused module. And lastly, funding will be used to hold more hackathon type events that advance data science skills and open science principles. Next slide, please. So open science is an ethos behind communities that are intrinsically motivated to contribute to the greater good of humanity. Working openly is a way of building bridges with the larger scientific community, creating more inclusive pathways for those looking to exp expand beyond their bounds. This in itself serves as a lifeline to many in marginalized communities, offering abundant opportunities for growth and development. This is about changing the framework of science. So we aren't just making room at the table, we're creating a new, more equitable table. And we need everyone in this endeavor. So we'll hope you'll come collaborate with us. We are working on GitHub, and I believe we'll post some links in the chat so that you can uh, join us in this great endeavor of NASA's. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cindy, for talking us through the work of such an important program, accelerating the engagement of the scientific community in open science practices. So we're now approaching our final talks of the week, and we have three amazing speakers here to wrap up the 2022 NASA Earth Science Applications Week with some closing remarks. So to start us off, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Karen St. Germain, NASA's Earth Science Division Director. Hi everyone, I'm uh, so pleased to join you. Uh, it's, it sounds like it's been a, uh, a fantastic week-long celebration of Earth and, uh, and what we know about it and also what we uh, 
uh, how we use that knowledge to inform uh, decisions we have to make every day. I think we might be having some audio issues from you, Dr. St. Germain. Um, Sydney or Lauren, could you confirm that it's the same on your end? Yeah, it seems like it might be a bandwidth issue. Okay. Maybe we will we'll give her a second to see if it comes back. Mm, okay. Well, maybe... Um, Maybe we can chat Dr. St. Germain and move on to our next speaker with closing remarks and circle back potentially, if that works. Um, so in that case, I can't hear anything coming from Dr. St. Germain's um, mic. So in that case, um, we will move on and hopefully circle back. Um, but up next, we have a video message from Dr. Kate Calvin, NASA's chief scientist and senior climate advisor. Hey, Sydney, we can't hear the audio. Thanks for letting me know, Lauren. I'll fix that real quick. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Earth Science Applications Week, where we explore how NASA helps bring Earth science to action through the applied sciences. I'm happy to be able to address you today. I wanted to start by giving a little bit of an overview of NASA's climate and earth science portfolio. So we use the unique vantage point of space to observe the Earth. NASA has more than two dozen satellites and instruments in orbit that can show us different aspects of Earth, from vegetation to clouds and precipitation to carbon dioxide and much more. And we've been doing this for decades, so we can see both the state of the Earth today and also how it's changed over time. As a result, we've gathered a huge amount of data that show how our planet's climate is changing from tracking ice sheets and their changes, monitoring sea level rise, measuring vegetation health, and so much more. NASA researchers are dedicated to the mission of improving the lives of people right here on our home planet through research, technology, and innovation. And we'll have a chance to share a snapshot of that with you this week. By viewing the Earth from space, we gain a unique perspective on the dynamic interconnected systems that make up our planet. Understanding these relationships help us tackle some of the most expansive and pressing issues of our time, like food insecurity, fresh water supply, and disease. We can use this global perspective to understand the Earth and also help local communities understand and respond to the challenges they face. The work conducted by our applied sciences team helps us understand our changing climate. So we have an enhanced understanding of carbon storage and the carbon cycle. We measure the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and model the impacts of future sea level rise, among other things. The work done by the applied sciences team connects that research with decision makers on the ground that can implement policies and actions informed by science. This week, we heard from many early career researchers and professionals conducting short-term projects, PIs working on long-term grant-funded research, and our partners who bring the benefits of Earth observations to their communities by incorporating science into their decision-making. These projects all share the goal of helping improve the quality of life for all on Earth. It's just a small sampling of what's done, though. And this small sampling is, is used to demonstrate the breadth of decisions that can be supported by Earth science data, from disaster response to water management to conservation and human health. Earth science data is incredibly valuable at informing decision makers. So I'd like to once again express my admiration for the researchers and teams here. The work you do is incredibly important, and I really enjoy learning about it and having the opportunity to tell others about it. Lastly, as you all well know, our planet's climate is changing. 
Global mean temperatures have risen over the last 100 plus years. And along with those increases in temperature, we're experiencing more extreme events like heat waves and wildfires. As a result of these changes, there's an increasing need for science to inform decision making at the individual level, as well as at the global scale. So I'd like to thank our applied science team for their work to bring science to communities every day. And I wanna thank our partner organizations for helping translate that science into things that decision makers can use. I'm really heartened by the attendance and the uh, participation of people this week. And I hope that this week inspires you throughout the year. So thank you. Great, what a wonderful message from Dr. Calvin. Um, unfortunately, it looks like we're having some audio issues with Dr. St. Germain. So for now, we are going to move on to our last, but definitely not least speaker. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to Lawrence Friedel, the director of the NASA's Applied Sciences Program. Great, thank you, Katie, and a very, very nice job uh, emceeing uh, this afternoon. Um, Many thanks to, to Kay Calvin for her remarks, and I really wish you could have heard um, Karen St. Germain. She is really, really passionate uh, about the Earth. As I mentioned on the, at the opening uh, of day one, we have one of the best jobs here uh, in Applied Sciences, and we hope you've seen why uh, this week. Uh, and I have to say, when I say we, um, that includes and extends to our broad family. Um, it's everyone at NASA who's doing this sort of work. Um, it's all of our partners who are advancing uh, the use of our science information. It's all of our project teams, both current, past, or, and as well as um, future ones, future teams uh, and their team members. Um, we, truly, um, we truly have the best mission uh, here at NASA. And we're pretty excited about what we do, um, connecting space and science to enable benefits uh, here on Earth across all kinds of themes, all kinds of sectors, working with all kinds of organizations in partnership with them to help them advance their mission. Uh, it doesn't get much better than that. And I have to say, when we look at it globally, with all of the misinformation, the alternative facts, the pseudoscience that's out there, our collective work by this community is all the more important. The broader work by everyone here to sort of advanced evidence based decision making and to help the public recognize the benefits that they get from science is critical and it's timely. Across this week and the roughly nine hours that we've had, we've showcased lots and lots of examples. Yet we also know that we couldn't showcase everything. And so thanks to all the project teams who did work that we couldn't fit into this week. Please know that your work is just as important. And we hope that we can showcase you in the future years or perhaps in some other way on our website or, or, or some other venue. We also recognize that as rewarding as this week has been, we know that there's still so much to do. There's new partners and there's more partners to be reached to, to reach. There's new satellites that are upcoming. There's new data products. There's an ever expanding and evolving research um, efforts and results, and there's new insights about how the earth works that we can bring in. But there's also other ways, there's other things that we also need to be doing. Um, there's ways that we can be more inclusive. Um, there's ways that we can help advance diversity in all of its forms. Um, there's ways that we can engage better with historically marginalized communities. There's ways that we can be approving our approaches to co-production uh, and so much more. So there's a lot of work still ahead as much as we're really excited about what we could showcase this week. We wanna to turn to saying thanks to, to many, many people. Um, this year's applications week was the result of work by so many people. And so first of all, really wanna say thanks to all the speakers. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, thank you. So first of all of our speakers, um, appreciate everything you've done and really we recognize that it's the, the you were sometimes speaking on behalf of project teams or colleagues and so thanks to the collective set um, we appreciate all the work that you did leading up to it all the prep and preparations you made for this week uh, and all of the excellent presentations uh, and talks that you all gave second we want to say thanks to i want to say thanks to the applied sciences team um, I have to say, 
The Applied Sciences team at headquarters is pretty darn incredible. Um, I am incredibly proud of the program. So my thanks to everything that this team, everything that they've done all year long and for all of the leadership that they've shown um, and everything that they've motivated other people to do. Uh, very much, thank you. Next, we wanna turn and say thank you to all the MCs. Um, we had a fantastic team of MCs from the DEVELOP program. Um, they handled everything with such poise and such grace. They really, really kept things moving along. So nice work uh, to all of the MCs across these different days. Final thanks are saved for a few key people. Sydney Neugebauer, Lauren Childs Gleason, Amanda Clayton, and Natasha Johnson Griffin. They have been working on this for months and they have done a tremendous job in so, so many ways. From scoping the week, to planning the sessions, to arranging and scheduling the speakers, to developing talking points for our senior leaders, and for making all of this just go so well. I have to say, going back to February, there was some combination of Sydney, Lauren, Amanda, and Natasha. They were regulars at my virtual office hours. And so they joined in to sort of share their ideas, talk about their progress, keep me updated on what was going on and overall the, the plans for the week. And so Sydney, Lauren, Amanda, and Natasha, thanks for everyone, um, for everything that you did. Um, and I hope you'll still drop by my office hours. Um, we're moving to a close, so we're almost done. Overall, we really hope you've learned something this week. Um, we hope you, we hope something has inspired you, or we hope maybe something has surprised you. And if that's the case, we hope you'll tell your professional colleagues about it, or maybe there's something that you want to go tell your parents or your grandparents or your children or your friends about. Uh, if so, please do. Please share this information about ways that science is serving society. And if nothing else, please take away from this week that this community of people that is doing earth science applications, they are passionate about serving society, about making the world a better place. Ooh. I'm absolutely proud of all the work and the projects that we are doing, but I'm even more proud about how they work. This attitude of public and global service is so, so commendable. I'm humbled and I'm extremely grateful to be part, part of this community. Finally, um, if you wanna relive key moments from the week, or if you want to access a talk or access a session, we're gonna be posting it uh, on the webpage for the 2022 applications week. We'll do this by the end of the month. Um, and we'll have all the slides there and the links to all the recordings. So with that, I'll officially close out Earth Science Applications Week 2022. Be well, do good, and see you next year. Thanks, everyone.